<clears throat> let me start this presentation off with a real good cough. Y'all let me know if y'all heard that cough. The sound check done. Audio's good. Thank you, Gerald. Turkenstein. Jamie, you guys fast on the take. I got my Arizona Skywalk shirt on from the Grand Canyon West. I'm a petrified forest national park. Been to both of them this year. <clears throat> All right. Again, as is my habit lately, I've been doing some long presentations because I've been packing them with a lot of material. So this is going to be a very in-depth overview, but it can only fit within two and a half hours or so. <clears throat> so for those of you who want to go in depth, then I suggest you go to the Lost, the Lost Secrets of Giza playlist where you'll come across about 30 hours of data sets and imagery and measurements that go into uh, extreme detail. I'm going to show you about 300 images here in this presentation, and we're going to go through it fast and rapidly because some of them don't, don't require a lot of explanation. Seeing is believing. So the subject matter of this presentation is very simple. <clears throat> the Great Pyramid at Giza is, it, it, according, you know, I showed you in my thumbnail, Civilization X. I use that term for a reason. The reason is, is I didn't coin it just like Martin Leakey. I've used Antiquitech, which was coined by Martin Leakey. I've used the word Technolithic, which is coined by James O'Conn. Sometimes we are researching things that are so anomalous and so far removed from the mainstream version of our reality that real innovative minds need to coin new terminology in order to describe what we're finding. And in this Civilization X is one of those terms. I didn't coin that either. Matter of fact, I came across that term about 10 years ago. Civilization X literally, literally refers to an unknown technologically advanced civilization sometime in the distant past. Now, this is the subject matter of Graham Hancock, Andrew Collins, Robert Bovell, many of these guys. And, and I agree with these guys in that respect. My only issues with, with all these authors, as you know, especially you archaics veterans, is chronological matters. As far as the concept of a technologically advanced civilization uh, in the ancient past, I have no problem with it. As a matter of fact, this presentation is going to prove that such a civilization existed because one of the chief artifacts that they left us specifically to endure all the way to the end is still standing in Egypt today. So... There's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of disinformation, a lot of specifically published data about the Great Pyramid that will lead you astray. Because what they're trying to, to not show you, what they're trying to, to get you from seeing are very salient points that need to be understood so you can recognize the level of deceit and deception that, is, that has been propagated in, in our institutions of learning. Yeah, the Great Pyramid of Egypt isn't Egyptian. It far antedates that civilization. In fact, it's not even located anywhere near the ancient Egypt that we've been educated about. And I'm going to show you that. So we're going to get into it. Let a few more people stack up in the chat and we're taking off. We are taking off. So my audio is pretty good. This is one of my first cameras. I've never removed this camera from the studio. Uh, this is one of those uh, uh, Adesso. It's an Adesso Cybertrack camera. It's just a clip on because I can't stand laptop and computer cameras. I always use use a camera I can move around. This one's pretty nice. I don't even think it's 70, 80 bucks. Works just fine. Riyadh Ali, you're right. Akuzan. One of the most ancient names for the Giza complex was Akusan. You're right. All right. So
Thank you, Pamela Swan. That link, uh, that link index, guys. You all, you all, you guys ought to copy and paste that and put that somewhere uh, in your files. That link index takes you straight to my website and gives you a full like seventy something links for everything archaics, all the free stuff, all the merchandise, all, all the playlists. Everything's in there. All published books, unpublished books, uh, super packs, thumb drives, anything, anything archaics is in that. Uh, in that link index. Appreciate you for posting that. I I should post it more often, but hi Tiger Turtle. Yeah, now I got this print this present this present feature down. I know all I gotta do is share a screen. Every once in a while I'm gonna have this this thing interrupting me. I got some app that went rogue. I went through my program files today and I deleted almost every app that I know I can delete without affecting the Microsoft files, but I don't know. I don't know what's doing it to my computer. This is a, this is a HP touchscreen home computer. I, I can do everything by hand, but I don't know. I don't know why it keeps interrupting with this weird app deal. All right, I'm going to share screen. I'm going to share entire screen. All right. Should have done that pretty fast. Look at that. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So I'm going to go down real quick. So we'll just go here. All right. Now that I'm sharing this screen, you guys, you guys already know what this is right here. I don't even have to tell you. In the distance, looking real small, or a, bu or a whole bunch of buildings in Cairo. That's the city of Cairo. These two, these two megaliths in front of it. Trying to make sure. There we go. There we go. I want to be able to make sure I can see you guys too. See you. These are the two great pyramids. Not a whole lot to look at. You've already seen million, many pictures of them, and I can't show you anything better than, than what you can see online anyway. The size. It's uh, we can thank Stephanie Smith of Eden Cafe for posting this a long time ago. Uh, I, I reached out there and grabbed it. You can see that tiny woman in the bottom and how big those blocks are. Those blocks are two and a half to five tons each. There are 203 layers of these blocks that start at the base and go all the way up at 51.5 51 degrees, going all the way up to the very top. Yeah, this is solid masonry. This isn't so this ain't this is not a a large mountain carved. This is not terraforming carving a mountain to make it look like a pyramid. That's different. This is solid construction. Each one of these blocks is fused together with adhesive 1 50th of an inch thick. There's supposed to be about 2.5 million of these blocks with the heaviest 70 ton blocks higher up in the structure. Okay, you guys know Many of you know, my archaics veterans know, that originally the Great Pyramid was bigger than it is today because it was covered in white limestone, 100-inch thick blocks. Now, this, is, this has been mentioned by many ancient authors, and it's almost unbelievable because the Great Pyramid we see today is at the top picture. The Great Pyramid described a long time ago is the bottom picture. It would have been bigger. It would have been 200 inches on all, uh, I mean, it would have been, the, its dimensions would have been 200 uh, inches larger to account for 100 inch casing stones on, on each side, no matter how you measured it. So the original casing blocks have been discovered in situ where they had been buried under the rubble. This discovery was in 1837, right here. Here's the in situ blocks. They're at the bottom. Now, before you accuse Jason of showing you a pen and ink illustration, you have to understand these. this was drawn when it was discovered. This is what they this is what they found. It shocked them because it, it it affirmed that all the old all the old books were right. Those they 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 got buried under a bunch of rubble and sand, and no one knew that those original casing blocks were still there. 
French mathematicians calculated by looking at the blocks that are still there, and they calculated that in order to cover the entire Great Pyramid's four source, four faces, it would have required 144,000 of these white stones. Now, here's a picture. I had to blow it up so it's a little blurry, but here's a picture right here. They were heavily damaged when all that all that surfacing of the Great Pyramid fell and, and buried them. And, and then over centuries, they stayed underground and in the sand under all that pressure. They fractured. But measurements have been done, and those casing blocks are laser smooth. The tolerances are equal to or greater even today as the marble on a bank building. This is the Mexican Pyramid. The reason I'm showing it is because I want to give credit where credit is due. In, in Central, in North Central and South America, we do have pyramids, but there's a fundamental difference. In fact, there are several fundamental differences. Look at this pyramid. It's beautiful. Now, it's a reconstruction, and, it, and you have to take into consideration, guys. We have the original pictures of these Mayan the, uh, these Mayan and Incan and uh, Olmec structures and the originals show that these were all falling apart and all that. Archaeologists have put this together. You don't have that with the Great Pyramid in Egypt. You don't. In Mexico and in Central America, Veracruz State, Oaxia, South America, and the Andes, those pyramids are reconstructions. They have been put back together, not only by modern archaeologists, but after they were destroyed in ancient times, they were, they were put back together or built over multiple times. Archaeologists have found many substructures underneath many of these pyramids. <clears throat> That's a huge pyramid, but... It's got four substructures on it, meaning four different time periods, four different cultures added to it. It's multiple buildings all stacked on top of each other. And then the out the outer, the outer area was all measured and made meticulous and precise and made to look like one big structure. But archaeologists have already tunneled into it and found multiple ancient structures all stack. You don't have that with the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is a structure that is still standing just like it was the day it was finished. All right, here's some more stairways to heaven were built everywhere. It's a concept. Stairway to heaven was a concept. Remember, the Great Pyramid was anciently referred to in the Egyptian Book of the Dead as the Ladder of Set. It was the Ladder of Heaven. It was the way by which you, you exited the Kingdom of Seeker, which was the Realm of Death. And you found the Gate of Rostal. In the Gate of Rostal, your spirit went through there and it was ejected out of the construct. This is the ancient Egyptian concept. And this ladder in the ancient Americas, when they brought these concepts to, to America, it, the ladder became a staircase. The concept is the same. The structures are nowhere near as old as the Great Pyramid, but they were all dilapidated. And what you're looking at are all reconstructions by archaeologists. Almost everything here was destroyed. Now, the concept in ancient America of the Great Pyramid and the eye and the Great Pyramid symbolizing not only doomsday, but also the closing of a great cycle is found right here. Right here in, in these Aztec glyphs, you see the crossed bars in the Aztecs in the Aztec uh, uh, symbols meant the completion of a cycle. Each bar is a cycle. Now, in this, in this, you see a little bricked pyramid at the bottom underneath an eyeball in the center. You see the Aztec doomsday glyph above all that. The concept is here. It's just been embellished by culture. Here it is again. On the left, you have the seven eyes of the Pleiades. These are the these are the seven sisters' eyes. These are the great uh, these are the great light bearers of the ancient world. This is the constellation that meant everything. The the Pleiades. You have the central eye right here, but this conceals a geometrical image which concerns the the closure of an epoch of time here it is the crossed bars on the left when you when you put the geometry together the way you're supposed to you have the pyramid on the right the eye is at the top 
Now, one of the bars has been removed. Therefore, a new cycle has begun after an old period has ended. Again, the Great Pyramid is associated to, to beginnings and endings or, or life and death. One of the concepts it's connected to in the Phoenix as well. So in the Ho in Frank Waters' book of the Hopi, we find we find this this ancient faith in the Hopi that there was a mountain somewhere that had a secret entrance, and if you could find that secret entrance, you could find the way home to the ancient Hopi. The way home was through a construction that had a hidden entrance. Process that for a minute. Like I said, we're going to be moving through this, guys. We've got a lot of ground to cover. i got some explosive new material to show you. Even my Archaics veterans are going to see new material here. Now, you can see here in, the, in, this, in this chart that the Great Pyramid of Giza is the largest pyramid. A lot of people are offended by that concept that just because something is big does not make it superior. But that's not the case here because in every single way, in every architectural uh, species of analysis, we will find that the Great Pyramid is superior to every other pyramid in the world. And this is by design. In fact, every other pyramid in the world was built after it. The greatest was built first during Civilization X. Every other pyramid in the world was an attempt to replicate the features and concepts for which the Great Pyramid of Giza embodied. But these were attempts that were done way later in time. And what's really embarrassing is that people don't notice that all these attempts by all these other civilizations were thousands of years after the Great Pyramid was already there. So here we have the, the, the next pyramid next to it. A lot of people call them the Great Pyramids and they think, they think they're equal. They're not. The Great Pyramid is much larger, and the Pyramid of Caffrey, the second pyramid, is not only smaller, but it's also on a raised platform, which provides you the optical illusion that it is somewhat the same size, and it's not. Then we have the Red Pyramid, which is mysterious as well. It's at 344 feet, which is 130-something feet less than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. So the Bent Pyramid, the, the Mausoleum uh, of Kenshi, Huang in China. Uh, we have the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of mass. It's a, it's a huge amount of mass. But the problem is it's four different pyramids before it. Each one was destroyed, dilapidated, fallen apart. New culture decides to rebuild. And what they do is they fill it with cement, lime, pebbles, cobbles, and they, they make a concretion, make it really even, and they build over it. That is not a true pyramid. A true pyramid is a single construction all the way through, not something that has been not, not something that has already fallen apart and had to be rebuilt in modern times. The Great Pyramid of Egypt has never come apart. Only its outer surfaces by earthquakes had 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 uh, basically fractured some of the hundred inch thick white limestone casing blocks off. And when the when the Muslims saw this in 1302 to 1340 A.D., they began they began mining all that material off of the Great Pyramid. And in so doing, they knocked so much rubble around the Great Pyramid that by the time Napoleon's men went there and Frederick Norton Lewis in 1740s uh, looked at that area and found fossils and, and, and seashells and, and marine marine life form skeletons all over the, all over the area, it says no one even knew that 40 and 50 feet down was the base of the pyramid. They all thought the pyramid was at the level right there. It's not, it wasn't. Yeah, it, it, it's, taken, it's taken over 120 years of excavations to remove all that sand and dirt and get it all out of the way. But the Great Pyramid of Egypt was buried. So anyway, you can see by the size differentials here, there is a massive amount of difference in the size of pyramids in the Americas. There's Pyramid of the Moon in Mexico. There's, there's a Cholula in Mexico. Here they are right here, guys. Here's the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. Vast difference in height. Now, in mass, in mass, it, it has been published that the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico, in mass, is more than the Great Pyramid. But then again, it, disqual it disqualifies itself by being four different substructures all stacked on top of each other. Therefore, it's not a true pyramid. It's like, it's like, it's like surfacing a hill with stone and then claiming that you built solid masonry all the way through. It's not true. And the, and the reason why all these pyramids are destroyed is because they were not built to the perfection of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. 
There have been hundreds of thousands of, of, of quakes, earthquakes, all kinds of things. And none of this is, none of this has affected, uh, uh, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, except for the casing blocks, and and if and if the ex Muslim extraction engineers had left it alone, we would see. If the Muslim extraction engineers would have left it alone, we would be, we would be seeing the Great Pyramid as it was originally, even today. Yeah, it took them over 50, 60 years to to mine all that stone, use it for ballast and roads and ballast and in ships, and use it for uh the uh. Sultan, Sultan Hassan's palace and mosque. Yeah, they did all that. I'm trying to find the bottom of my chat, make sure everything's going good. All right, back to it. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not talking about the Bajan pyramids in, in, in this presentation. I have never talked about the Bajan pyramids because the size, the size of the structures coming out of Bajna would not be true pyramids. They would be terraforming. I'm not saying they're not real. We have evidence of terraforming. But terraforming is when you take a solid rock structure and you carve it into the shape that you want. That's not a pyramid. It's just pyramidal. All right. It's like advanced Feng Shui. So we're moving on. So... Here it is again, tallest pyramid again, it's a great pyramid in Egypt. There it is right there. Here's the, here's here's computer models of other other very large structures. Here it is again. Here's no, here's some more comparisons between the great pyramid and other pyramids. Again, it's the size is important, the mass of rock is amazing, the weight, the the pressure, but again, Again, we're not going to concentrate on the size. The size alone is not what makes the Great Pyramid great. It's not, it's not what makes the Great Pyramid very, very unique. You'll see that in this presentation. So the pyramids in the Americas, they're far more impressive than Egyptian ones outside the Giza complex. What I'm saying is, is that you can tell that the pyramids in the Americas have more imagination. There's more in, uh, engineering. There's more ingenuity. People were, there's more creative license. A lot of culture, a lot of culture was added into building these pyramids. So basically, what it was was survivors post reset after a cataclysm knew they knew their educators knew about the Great Pyramid. They knew about its function. They knew the origin. They knew who, why basically it was built. They knew what it embodied, it represented. And I'm going to get to that in here because there were a lot of traditions about the Great Pyramid preserved the past, the present, and the future. It was prophecy in stone. This is the this is the ancient model for the Great Pyramid belief system. So we have we have the same thing being being shown in ancient Americas. In Egypt, they tried to copy the Great Pyramid, and it was disastrous. Pyramids collapsed. Pyramids were unfinished. Some uh, Egyptologists try over and over and over to claim that the Bent Pyramid was intentional. That's the way they want it, and it's not. They made mistake after mistake after mistake. Trying to replicate the 51-degree angle was not easy. The Great, Pyra the Great Pyramid's faces were, were it's just... The building, the building techniques that were used for the Great Pyramid were not replicated by the later civilization that tried to build pyramids. If they had had the same machines, the same technology, the same engineering sciences, if they would have had the same architectural templates to, to, to work off of, if they would have had the same infrastructures, they might have been able to replicate it had they have known about its most mysterious features, which they didn't. I'm going to get to that real quick. Something about the Great Pyramid that is different than every other pyramid in the entire world. Look at these pyramids in America. Yeah, they're impressive. This one's half as tall as the Great Pyramid in Egypt, but it's got more mass. But archaeologists have already proven through tunneling into it, it's four different structures, each one buried in dirt and rubble and gravel so they could build another structure on top of it. And then that one was destroyed. And then people built, they buried that one in dirt and then more clay and rubble and, and cobbles. And then they, they bricked over that. That's not a true pyramid at all. This is four stru This is four structures stacked on top of each other. And still it's nowhere near the true size of the great pyramid. So there's a lot of artistic license. They, they, 
Oh, they borrowed many, many concepts from the ancient world and incorporated them into their into their architecture. Yes, it's a it is a, a known astronomical feature. It has been published since the 1910s, 1920s that the Mayan pyramids have shadow effects. When the sun goes down, the sun comes up. You can see the serpents going up and down the staircases. This has been widely known and, and been published for long periods of time. Remember what I've told you in prior presentations, guys. Serpents, serpents were symbols for cycles. They were when a serpent is coiled around something, that period of time, that epic, that 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 age of the world is still continuing. When the when a cycle is over, the serpent swallows his tail. That cycle is closed. It's over with. Here's another one. Explore the pyramids. There it is right there. But these are pyramids in Egypt. All these are pyramids in Egypt right here. The Great Pyramid is Khufu in the middle. Was it built by Khufu? Hell no. But that's what we have to call it because that is that that's what we I that's what we've all agreed is the Pyramid of Khufu in all in all these uh history books. So in order to and, and the next one is Caffrey, but it doesn't mean Caffrey built it. It doesn't even mean Khufu and Caffrey are real Egyptian pharaohs, whoever whoever existed in history. This is just the standard version given by a Egyptian priest to a Greek in a Greek who recorded it, 440 BC. We don't know if it's true because it's the only record in the ancient world that even says that. And we know from the story of Solon and Atlantis that that Solon completely misunderstood many of the things the, the Egyptian priest said. We have, we have affirmatively proven in archaics, even to the point of calling out the entire community for a debate as, as to the dating of Atlantis being the 13th century BC and not that ridiculous dating of 9,600 BC. 9,600 BC is ridiculous dating because all you're doing is adding adding a mistake from the ancient world of 9,000 years when he was told 9,000 moons. And this was corrected even in the days of Plato by a scholar and mathematician named Eudoxus of Nidus. So the same, so the exact same issue could be applied here. Herodotus didn't quite understand what was being said. So he, he, these priests didn't even know. In 440 BC, it was already 200 years after the last Egyptian dynasty had collapsed. So whoever was telling Egyptian history didn't even know it themselves when they told them about Khu Khufu and Khafre and uh, how many slaves it took to build it all. It's all BS. The Egyptians never knew. Proof the Egyptians never knew who built the original Great Pyramid is coming in this video real quick. True Egyptian pyramids built about a thousand years after the Giza complex is fixed, is finished. Look at these pictures. I didn't make up these pictures. These are real pictures from today of pyramids in Egypt. What do you see here? Do you see anything like the Great Pyramid in Egypt? Do you see anything like the Great Pyramid at Giza? No. What you see are structures that are inferiorly built and subject to earthquakes and the passage of time. They've all collapsed. They've all collapsed. Here they are. These are Egyptian pyramids. Here they are. They look real good in the encyclopedias. They look real good in all the history books. But these are the actual photos of, of existing pyramids in Egypt today. They look real good. Here's the best pictures right here. There's the Bent Pyramid. There's Dashur. <clears throat> yeah, guys. Some of these look like Sumerian pyramids. Mastabas. Oh, here's the Red Pyramid of Dashur. The greatest and true of the Egyptian pyramids is still 140 feet shorter than the Great Pyramid of Giza. There it is right there. It's a much smaller pyramid. It's much more inferior built. But the ang the only reason this pyramid survived so long is look at look at the angle. That angle is nowhere near 51 degrees. The Great Pyramid is steep. The 51 degree angle with 756 foot sides is why the Great Pyramid is 454 feet in height. It's massive. That 51 degree angle is almost impossible to replicate without machines to maintain true course after course after course after course after course. 203 courses from the baseline of the monument all the way up the structure to the flat top where the chief cornerstone is supposed to sit represented by the Bin Bin stone 
in the ancient city of Memphis, Heliopolis, called, called in the second millennium BC, the city of Anu, A-N dot N-U. That's the name, that's the ancient, this is what it's called in all the ancient Egyptian texts, Anu. It's where the mansion of the Phoenix was. And the mansion of the Phoenix had the priesthood that was protecting the Ben Ben stone. They thought they had to protect the Ben Ben stone because one day it would be of service again. Now, here we go. Look at that. The Great Pyramid is massive. It's massive in stone. But look at the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building is hollow. That's what its purpose is. Its purpose is to house offices and flats and ballrooms and restaurants, eateries. The gr it is a building with the purpose of having thousands of humans doing all the things they need to do. <coughs> Therefore, it is almost hollow. The Great Pyramid is virtually solid. And mathematicians have estimated that the stone required to build the Great Pyramid is equal to about 10 Empire State Buildings worth of rock. Here's some more size comparisons. <coughs> Check my chat. Well, that's the Chrysler building, huh? All right, so look at this. Look at the size of the Great Pyramid back there, guys. Look at the size of that structure compared to these modern buildings. The Eiffel Tower doesn't even qualify because it's not a, it's not it's not masonry. It's nowhere near the weight. It's made out of steel, but it is nowhere near the weight of the Great Pyramid. It has it doesn't have the mass. It's virtually a frame. It's hollow. It's hollow. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just huge. These are these pictures are just there to show you guys, give you an idea of the size that we're talking about. So Herodotus, Strabo, Diodorus, and a host of other, like Plutarch, a host of other ancient authors all wrote about the original condition of the Great Pyramid. This is what they describe. Strabo said that from a great distance as you're approaching Egypt, you can look over the desert of sand and the Great Pyramid looks like a building being lowered from heaven. That's not a metaphor, guys. That is exactly what people saw because of the heat baking off the ground. Though Everything at eye level would have been blurry the same way as you stand on a highway and you look 10 miles up the highway. It looks like cars are floating down the highway. You can't see their tires because all the heat, all the heat rising from the concrete. The same thing applied to the Great Pyramid. From a distance, it would look like the pyramid was floating in the sky. The closer people got to it, the closer the pyramid got to the ground. It's an optical illusion. Look at them people there. None of those people are alive anymore. Year 1900. All right. So that sums up. That sums up that file. Check my chat before we get to this next file. Look at my time. I can't see the time on here. Hmm. <clears throat> so, moving to the next file. This is a very key integral piece, piece of the puzzle, guys, right here. What you're looking at right here is a cross section of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. The reason you have never seen cross sections from, of, of, of like this on any other pyramids is because there's nothing to cross section. Understand what I'm saying. Pyramids all over the world have replicated the entrance, which is above the ground, which descends below the foundation of the pyramid, all the way underneath the pyramid to a subterranean chamber right here. This is replicated all over the world, all over the world. This subterranean chamber right here with a pit. The pit is replicated as well. This whole long tunnel right here is replicated all the way 
out here. But everything you see above this, the first ascending passage, grand gallery, horizontal passage, what they call the queen's chamber, what they call the antechamber, the king's chamber, the air shafts. Guys, none of this is replicated in any other pyramids of the world. And the reason why is because when they took their pyramid knowledge and concepts in their dispersion after the cataclysm and they went their separate ways and then began building, building their own civilizations and they knew the importance of the pyramid and they began building pyramids everywhere, none of those people had ever been privy to the fact that the architects had designed all this stuff in the upper interior of the pyramid because it was very, very cleverly hidden right here with a gigantic ceiling block right here. Ceiling block, a ceiling block covered this area right here. For thousands of years, people went down this descending to the subterranean chamber and they did rituals, all kinds of stuff. Famous people been down uh, down there in ancient times. But, but right here, there was a ceiling block. And behind the ceiling, that was the shape of it too. That was the ceiling plug. Behind it was three gigantic granite plugs. No one knew that was there until 820 AD when the Muslims tunneled into the, the, to the structure. Here's another cross section. No ancient civilization knew the king's and queen's chamber and the grand gallery. The ascended passages were there. Here's another cross section from. This is straight out of Sir, Sir Flinders Petrie's book. This is the guy who measured everything inside and outside of the Great Pyramid to the thousandths of an inch. This is his book, The Great Pyramid of Giza, right here, or The Pyramids of Giza. <coughs> I believe he got the illustration from uh, Howard Colonel Weiss. Here's another cross section. None of this was known in the ancient world. Here's, here's another illustration of the cross section. None of this was known in ancient times. Moving through, here's a, here's a really detailed cross section showing the individual blocks. All this stuff here. None of this was known in the ancient world. Here's a blow up of what was not known. There it is. There's a blow up of it right there. Horizontal passage, queen's chamber, grand gallery, antechamber, air shafts, none of that. Relieving chambers called Davidson's chambers way up here. The coffer, none of this was known in the ancient world. This is why it wasn't copied any time other pyramids were built. Here it is. Here's a cross section of the three great pyramids, and you can see the great pyramid has all the interior arrangements that the other pyramids do not. Again, cross sections, very studied widely today since the 1880s. All since the 18, all this has been studied because the Great Pyramid is very different than any other pyramid in the world. No other pyramids have these features. Here it is, right here. Again, another cross section, a lot more detail. All this upper, all these upper passages, all these upper upper chambers. None of this was known. This is the Grand Gallery. <clears throat> Grand, Grand Gallery is amazing. <coughs> it's been damaged a lot, chipping away, trying to find stuff, trying to find secret tunnels and all that. But, but the Grand Gallery is, it has a machine quality to it. Even though it's, even though we're dealing with something that's almost five thousand years old, it is still. Look at the, look at these ruts on the bottom. This is a track. Many people have researched this. This is a track on a ledge. There's a similar track on the opposite leg, ledge and each each indentation is equidistant from the other as if this track, something laid on this track so something at high velocity under a pressurized environment could move up and down very, very fast. I'm telling you now the Great Pyramid is technolithic, meaning it, it required machines to build, but the Great Pyramid itself is also a machine. Well, let me turn this down. All right. It's also a machine. Look at this technolithic precision here. David, engineer David Davidson drew this to show how absolutely precise this is. They're sunk into the wall. Here's cross sections of the indentation. This is a machine. This is machined. In addition to that, it, it served the purpose of being components to a much larger machine for which the Grand Gallery serves. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, guys. Here's, a grand, here's another picture of the grand, grand Gallery here. You can, see the, you can see the tracks. 
You can see the indentation on the walls going all the way up on both sides. The tracks are on a raised platform on either side, whereas deeper below down here where they have a ramp. See, these rails and ramp, that was built in recent times. They were, there's no, they're not an original part of the construction. You can see that here. See? Look at this. This is a grand gallery. They didn't know what they were looking at. They're exploring it. They have no idea. They got these huge tracks. It's real hard to walk up. It's very, very steep. It's a 26, 26 point five degrees. That's the pitch. It's 26 degrees, guys. It is, it's not easy. There it is right there. The old pictures. I shouldn't have had that picture in there. I didn't know it was an old, a Lamy picture or whatever it is. Look at this. Old illustration right here. They're, they're researching everything with ladders and candles and lamps. They're trying to find anything, anything in this thing. They didn't know what it was when they found it. They had no idea. They're tunneling into different parts of the Great Pyramid. They're doing more damage than good. But this is what they found. This is this square right here goes to the Queen's Chamber right here, which is another enigma, not replicated anywhere in the world by any other pyramid. This grand gallery, there is, there's only one other structure in the ancient world that mimics the architecture of the grand gallery. I'm about to show it to you. Look at this. This is as the pyramid was being built. As the pyramid was being built, this is the grand gallery. Look at the, look at the track on the bottom. The illustrator made sure the track is there so you know this is the grand gallery. This is the grand gallery pointing up 26 degrees into the sky. Ancient astronomers, as the pyramid was, built, was being built, were looking for something or measuring something, and here it is. This is what they would have saw before the pyramid reached Get this, guys. This is crazy because the, the Grand Gallery goes up to 138 feet. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. 138 feet into the structure, the Grand Gallery ends. So this is what they were doing. They were looking for something. Here's the Cave of the Sibyl. Now, the Great Pyramid is attached to the past, the present, and the future. It is a past to the idea of prophecy. It, can, it was built in the beginning, but it was built to survive the millennia until a future generation that would require whatever it is that the Great Pyramid does. It was built for that purpose. This is what the traditions attached to the Great Pyramid convey. This is, and I'll get to that in a minute. This is what the cops say. This is what the ancient Arab, Arabic scholars say. It was specifically built to preserve the past, present, and future. It is a prophecy in stone monument. It is the same concept of the Sibyls. Here it is. This is the entrance to the cave of the Sibyl. What does it look like? What were the Sibyls? The Sibyls were oracles. They were, they were all about prophecy. Now, they later became like an intelligence apparatus, but originally they were for, for divining. Where did the Sibyls come from? The Sibyls came from northern Egypt. I'm not making that up. That's the ancient authors say that. Here's a cross-section right here. Very unique architecture. Here it is. Look. Can't miss that. There's the antechamber. There's the antechamber. There's the top of the grand. There's the top of the grand gallery. The grand gallery ends right here. Do you see where my little cursor is? That's called the Great Step. That is the central axis to the Great Pyramid. That is zero degree meridian for the Great Pyramid. That's the central axis for the whole monument. It's right here. Right there on that, that face of that step. It's called the Great Step. It begins a huge slab floor to the King's Chamber right here. The Great Step is amazing because the bottom of the great step and the grand gallery right here where my little cursor is is exactly 138 feet high in the monument i'm gonna show i'm gonna show it to you guys as we move along here it is queen's chamber there's another feature in the wall right here. It's machined. It's, preci it's precise. What is this feature? It looks like a grand gallery. It looks like a grand gallery is supposed to be here, right here. Could it be right here at the Queen's Chamber that it is the intention in the future to, to break through this, this area of the wall because another grand gallery is there? Or was this an astronomical observatory before they reached this height in the pyramid and covered it up with, with higher courses of stone? I don't know. I'm only theorizing. But this is the architecture of the Great Pyramid. It is not replicated anywhere else in the world. This, too, is an anomaly. It's the Queen's Chamber. Again, here's another cross-section of 
Oh, uh, here's the relieving chambers. These are 70 ton slabs. Each one of them is to is basically to relieve pressure away from the king's chamber. The immense amount of weight way up another 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 80 something courses of rock the weight is so much that this was designed to to spread the weight out and keep it off of the king's chamber nowhere in the world do we find this type this type of arch uh, architecture nowhere this is this is one of the main reasons the great pyramid in egypt is absolutely absolutely unique it ha it has it has no equals here it is guys right here Another cross section. Here's here's where the descending passage and and ascending passage meet. That's Sir Flinders Petrie there. So, <clears throat> for thousands of years, the entrance to the pyramid has been been completely hidden. It's right here. When everybody goes down, is this little hole over here? They got a little hole down here, a little square hole down here that goes down the descending passage. But the original entrance is. Is is uh? I have a video too that shows the uh. Let me go back. I have a video called Antiquitech that shows the original entrance. I have a one hundred year old illustration from a it's a it's a book over a hundred years old where I show that the entrance to the Great Pyramid is right here. It's right here, hidden behind these blocks. What you're seeing in this picture. Right here, you see the you see those big diagonal blocks. That's the original entrance to the Great Pyramid before they hid it. They hid it under all these courses of blocks. You know, all this is not natural. They dug all this out to reveal that after they found it. But what you're looking at is right here. It's this block here. It's these and this. These big blocks hid, concealed an entrance that goes all the way over here, even with the Queen's Chamber. There it is. The queen's chamber floor right here is even all the way with the original entrance of the Great Pyramid, which is right here. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting, guys. So this is what makes the Great Pyramid unique of all the pyramids in the world. Oh, uh, this is the first piece of evidence right here, guys. Not just the size, but not just the fifty-one degree angle, which every pyramid. Well, most pyramid, ancient pyramids tried to replicate, and in Egypt they collapsed. But here it is: the upper get grand, the grand gallery, the ascendant chamber, the antechamber, the granite leaf in the antechamber. None of this has been replicated. The great step, the king's chamber, the relieving chambers, Davidson's chamber. None of this, guys. This is why the Great Pyramid in Egypt is absolutely in a league of its own. Let's go to the next file. See, before we go to the next file, see how I'm doing in this chat. How my chat doing? Let me find out y'all are talking to each other and not even paying attention to me. Hey, Jahara. Hadn't seen you in a while. <clears throat> I appreciate you, moderators. I did change my chat. It's the very this is the very first video that I ever I ever activated the uh, only subscribers can engage in the chat. I'm going to keep that too. Every video from here on out. Yeah. If you're not willing to subscribe, then you shouldn't be willing to, to, uh, to make comments either or have your comments dignified with a response. So yeah, so for here, for here on out, for here on out in my, in my, in my, all my live videos, if you're not subscribed to my channel, don't, you're, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to participate in the chat. I think it's only fair. <clears throat> I didn't even know I had that option. I was going through my features the other day. Now, in this presentation, I'm not going to go into detail as to what I think the Great Pyramid machine engineering function was. I mean, I've said it in the past. I think it was some type of free energy. It was a pump. It, it, it literally created power using water you know i've explained how i think that was that that was happening but i believe we're missing some key components those key components are machine parts that are specifically supposed to be assembled in the grand the grand gallery i believe that whatever whatever is missing from the grand gallery was something that could be taken apart and then 
put somewhere else for safety, probably an alloy that, that there's no risk of it uh, deteriorating. So uh, <clears throat> this is this would be closer to like Christopher Dunn's area of expertise. Let's get on. We got we got we got more to cover, guys. We got more to cover. And remember, if this if this pre this is just an overview. You need to go to that lost lost uh, scriptures. I mean, the lost secrets of Giza playlist, and you're going to get overwhelmed with amazing material about the Great Pyramid of Egypt. So, <clears throat> all right, here's something we need we need to look at. We need to pay close attention to this. Oh, this is going to be blurry because I got to blow it up. All right. So, in my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, I give multitudes of sources from ancient authors and traditions about the Great Pyramid was considered to be the pillar, the altar, the monument, the mountain at the center of the earth. It was considered to be the Axis Mundi. In the ancient world, it was at zero degrees. Uh, it was at the zero degree meridian. It was the prime meridian of the ancient world. I'm, it's still up to debate with me if, if it was also, if it was actually zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude. I don't know for sure, but I'm confident based off all the ancient texts that I've cited in Lost Scriptures of Giza that it was considered to be the prime meridian of the ancient world, which would be zero degrees longitude. I'm just not sure if it was zero degrees latitude yet. Now, this is what we see. The present location of the Great Pyramid makes it According and this is this has been published in many books, guys. Taylor published this. John Taylor published this. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, uh, Astronomer Royal, Royal Charles Piazzi Smith in the 1880s published this. Uh, Sir Flinders Petrie commented on it. Um, uh, engineer David Davidson and H. Alder Smith in the 1920s, they, they, they showed this picture and they mentioned this. Uh, Adam Rutherford, of, of the, uh, the founder of the American Institute for Pyramid Research, uh, discusses this. The pyramid was the center of the Earth's land masses. This is also the subject matter of a book by E. Raymond Capt and uh, Bonnie Gaunt. Now, I could go on, guys. Pyramid research, pyramid research has been going on for 200 years, and the amount of data that we have would normally blow people's minds. I can't, I can't pack it all into one presentation. That's why I have this whole playlist. So, Anyway, the Great Pyramid was considered to be the center of Earth's land masses. It's right there. Here it is again, Mount Sumeru at the center of the Earth. There it is right there. Northern Egypt, called, called Lower Egypt, right there, 108 miles from the, from the Mediterranean coast, separated only by the Nine Bows, which are the nine rivers that come off the Nile River, is the, is the dead center of the ancient world right here. This is Giza. That's what it says right there, Giza. It's North Africa. It's the center of the Earth's land masses. Now, but even more so, there's a depiction at the bottom, but even more so, there's the Great Pyramid right there. Do you see how they blew this Great Pyramid right here? Here's the Great Pyramid. What do you see? Look at this. This is a 90 degree angle. This is a quadrant, guys. It is one fourth of a circle. This quadrant completely encompasses the nine bows. This is the region of Goshen in the Old Testament where the Israelites lived. It was like a paradise. It's right here. These are the nine rivers that come off the Nile River. The Great Pyramid is at the head of this area. Remember in the prophetic text, now, you know, in the in the Old Testament, uh, well, well, you know, in the Old Testament, we have Abraham. In the New Testament, it says Abraham went to Egypt to look for a city whose builder and maker was God. Where do you think Abraham went? In my Lost Scriptures of Giza, I show you where he went. He went to the, he went to the Egyptian priestly colleges and he taught them the business. 
If you want to know the career of Abram and Abraham and who he was in ancient Egypt, and you want to see the source materials, you want to see the receipts, they're in my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza. And since then, I've even released some new data and videos about, about Abraham in Egypt. But uh, here it was. Remember, in the prophetic material, rivers of living water issue out of the divine mountain. So here's an interesting deal. As the Aztecs knew of a place called the Nine Rivers where souls of the dead paid a toll to a dog. I'm going to tell you what, guys. This is the same as the ancient Egyptian Rostal tradition of the Nine Bows where souls of the dead entered where a secret entrance is located underneath the Sphinx. I've already told you guys, we've been lied to so many times. The Sphinx was never a lion in a body. It's not a feline body. The Sphinx was a canine body that has been manipulated. And the greatest proof is the dimensions of the head. Anyone who's looked at an aerial phot photograph of the Sphinx knows that the head has been whittled down so disproportionately from the body that it's not an original statue anymore. The largest surviving statue from the ancient world at 240 feet in length, 66 feet high. And yet the head looks like a pea compared to this great big body. It's got a human face on it now wearing an Egyptian headdress. That is not what it was. It was originally, just like the Aztecs say, a giant dog. It was Anubis. <clears throat> so here, here's... Here's an integral fact that you need to take into consideration when you when you think about pyramids and associate them to Egypt. Okay, do you see all the pyramids are in the north? Look at this area I circled. All the pyramids in Egypt are right here in the north. Every single one of Egypt's 137, some encyclopedias say 138 pyramids, all right here. In the north. The problem we have, this is called Lower Egypt. In Lower Egypt, according to Frederick Norton Lewis in the 1740s and to 60s, when he was at Giza, he found the Great Pyramids half buried in sand and covered in seashells and the skeletons of marine creatures. This entire area this entire area had once been underwater, and the Great Pyramids, according to him, must have been underwater as well. Now, now on my channel in a past video, I read to you guys what Al-Biruni wrote in his book a thousand years ago, an Arabic scholar, when he traveled the world. He said that the brown stain of the, of the ancient uh, level of the sea, the Mediterranean, was much higher. He says, well, I, I'm, I'm lying to you. The Mediterranean was not much higher. The entire North African plate had suffered subsidence and went down. Just like in my in my description of the flood of Ogyges, in my five videos of the flood of Ogyges, I revealed to you that the reason why the petrified coastlines are at 12,000 feet elevation is because during the Phoenix phenomenon, 1687 B.C., it was a ge it was geologic upheaval. But at the same time that mountains can appear in minutes, so can so can islands vanish as I as I've also documented, like Davis Island, completely vanished, full of all, all of its occupants, never to be seen again, totally taken off the maps. So, again, ancient Egypt's old name is the Raised Land. Process that it was called the Raised Land. Now, in my Chronicon, I show you that for 340 years, the Great Pyramid was underwater. And this is where all the damage came to the original Sphinx. The Sphinx was not protected in 100-inch thick white limestone casing blocks. So, the salt water of the Mediterranean heavily damaged the Sphinx, while it didn't damage the Great Pyramid at all. It was protected in white limestone armor that wasn't removed till thousands of years later. But look at all these pyramids. Egyptian Egyptian textbooks and videos always want you to associate pyramids to the Egypt that they're trying to pass off as, as being the only Egypt. But it's not. 416 miles to the south is another Egypt. This is why in the ancient world, it was always called 
two Egypts. Always. It's called the two kingdoms. It was called the two Egypts. Look down here, guys. Down here, they buried pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings. That's where they found King Tut. That's where they found all the pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings. They ever found any mummies? You mean any mummies in pyramids? No. Here's the Valley of the Kings down here. Oh, look what else is down here. Waset, Edfu, ancient Thebes, Karnak, Dendero. Look at all. Look at all, Dendero. Look at all this. All this down here is ancient Egypt. 416 miles away from pyramids. There are no pyramids in Waset. This is the ancient kingdom of Kamesia. This is Kemet, also known as Waset. It's right here. There are no pyramids here at all. They're way up in the north. Now, for those for those who have been paying attention to my channel, and I cite all, all these historians like Professor Waddell and Albert T. Clay and all these people in Thor Heyerdahl, the two Egypts were fundamentally different. Northern Egypt, which is called Lower Egypt, was cosmopolitan. Many different races lived here together. Not so in Southern Egypt. Southern Egypt was a red-skinned race. They were native. They were na they, they stayed down here. And they were, they were a different Egypt. There was often two pharaohs on the throne at, at the same time. And this has caused a lot of problems with Egyptian chronology. So, let's move on. Look at this. Look at all these pyramids. Hundreds of miles of desert between earliest Egypt and Giza. Look at that. Look at this. Every original city and the earliest cities of Upper Egypt were within a day's walking distance of Thebes. Here's Thebes. Within a day, you could walk to any of the other Egyptian cities. This is almost how all ancient civilizations were, because you walked everywhere. Every pre-dynastic temple and pyramid north of this was underground or underwater at one time. All these right here, earthquakes have toppled a lot of these ruins, but the locations of these cities have never been lost. Right here, they're not this. This Egypt down here is nowhere near as old as the Egypt up here. The Egypt up here was pre cataclysm. After the cataclysm, this, this giant Giza complex of pyramids was the only pyramids here. After the cataclysm, after 1899 BC, when an earthquake turned this area into what ancient texts call the raised land. It brought it out of the water. Did people move in here and start trying to build pyramids to copy the Great Pyramid? But they weren't very successful at all. Here's Google Maps. Google Maps, guys. This play. This is this is way. <coughs> this is huge. This is huge, guys. <coughs> you see this blue line on Google Maps? If you're driving the speed limit in Egypt today, it will take you eight hours, excuse me, eight hours and 27 minutes for, to get between both Egypts. Egypt of the pyramids and way down here, the ancient Egypt of Kamesia, of Kemet, Kim, Waset. Eight hours and 27 minutes of driving, but in the ancient world, they didn't draw, drive, they walked after the cataclysm. Jerusalem is 271 miles from the Great Pyramid. Jerusalem in Palestine is 271 miles from. It means Jerusalem is closer to the Great Pyramid than, than southern Egypt is to the Great Pyramid. That's a problem. Look at this. Here's the two Egypts, but on this map, they're represented as one Egypt, but in the ancient world, it was always two Egypts. Here it is. The two capitals. One is Memphis in the north, Thebes in the south. These are two different Egypts. And they're 416 miles apart. But look over here. Look at Sumer. Look how close the Sumerian cities are. Look at Susa. Susa was a whole different culture. They were enemies of the Sumerians. They were the Elamites. Look at Babylon, ba Babylonia, Babylon and Assyria were enemies. Look how close they are. Look at the city of Asher. And, there, and there's many other, Nimrod, Kalna, 
uh, Eric, or there's a bunch of other places not, not shown here. Look at the Amorite state of Mitanni. The, 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 uh, the Mitannian Empire was absolute enemies with the Hittite Empire nationally. The Amorites were also enemies with the Assyrians. And they're tucked in between them. Look at these, look at these states and empires, guys. Look how close they are together. Way down here in the two Egypts, it's 416 miles from the nearest pyramid. When you get to Thebes, yeah, it's even it's even further than that to the nearest pyramid. It's crazy. At average, walking 20 miles a day, it takes 20, 20.5 20 days to walk from Giza to the Valley of the Kings. It's crazy. And you're walking through a desert. So this is just to provide you perspective to provide you some good perspective at the great vast distances that we're looking at here uh, uh, considering the Great Pyramid and its exclusivity, how it is very separate from traditional Egyptian civilization. I'm talking about the ancient Egypt of Southern Egypt, which is highly promoted in today's culture, in media, in Hollywood. And they're always throwing pyramids in there every time. I mean, even the Moses movies are throwing pyramids in there, but they're not there. At all. Oh, got the rhino from Texas in the house. Maurice Demers, how you doing? So. Let me get let me get back into this presentation. I see everything's okay. <clears throat> all right. All right. So this is going to be really fast because it's going to lead into to, to my presentation. What you're looking at are the absolute precise, meticulous measurements. Here's the Great Pyramid. There it is. These are the absolute measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie. Here they are. Endorsed. They are endorsed by engineer David Davidson and H. Aldersmith. These, these measurements don't mean anything to you right now. Here they are. I'm, I'm showing them because I, I show them in all my videos. I show them in all my presentations. I've posted them on Facebook. These are for everybody to see because what follows is unbelievable. These are done to the thousands of an inch using your know, rule and micrometer. Sir Flinders Petrie. This is, the, this is how it went down, guys. This is how it went down. I'm going to tell you the story as I'm showing you these pictures. In the 1740s and 60s, Frederick Norton Lewis surveyed the Giza site and he realized this is something very different than what he had heard about. The Great Pyramid was something very different than, than what he had been led to believe. It was more than just an Egyptian pharaoh's tomb. He didn't believe that. Uh, he found the seashells, fossils, uh, found, it, found it buried in sand. Uh, and this led to many, many other pamphlets being promoted in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And several researchers started seriously looking into the Great Pyramid. And then one became famous named John Taylor, who published a book written in 1859. In 1860, it was widely distributed called the Great Pyramid Uh it talked about the patriarchs, the Old Testament, the pre-flood world. This is a book from 1859. John Taylor's book on the Great Pyramid woke people up and they realized, oh my God, this pyramid may be a calendar. It may be prophecy in rock. But remember Oliver Wendell Holmes, I quoted him earlier in, in, in the chat section. When the human mind is stretched by a new idea, it can never go back to its original dimensions. Oliver Wendell Holmes published that. I'm telling you now, what John Taylor published started something. Because now researchers all over the world were looking at the Great Pyramid differently. Now the measurements mattered. Now the fact that there was an ascending passage, Grand Gallery, there was all these different services that meant now everything was, was, was looked at with a new perspective because he believed it had calendars and ratios and that everything about our reality was recorded in these measurements. And he, he, he proved his case on many things and some of it was outright wrong because he didn't have the accurate measurements. But he got the attention of other people. John Taylor's work was really impressive, but it was nowhere near as impressive as when Astronomer Royale 
Charles Piazzi Smith of, of Scotland decided to take up the mantle, went to Egypt with his wife and his crew, and he went and he he also measured all kinds of stuff and published a book. I have it in my library called The Great Pyramid, Our Divine Inheritance. It's an amazing book. He too did not have totally precise, accurate measurements, but he did find out enough to, to wake up the scientific scientific community that they had a problem. This is how this situation came about. It is so stunning that the scientific community saw the work of Charles Piazzi Smith as a threat. Charles Piazzi Smith did not make totally accurate measurements. So they sent a giant in the field of archaeology someone who did not believe in the biblical stories, someone who did not believe anything about the Great Pyramid being a calendar, being part of prophecy, didn't believe any of this. He even went to his deathbed not believing it. His name is Sir Flinders Petrie. This man went to the Great Pyramid not, to, not, not because he was going to prove Charles Piazzi Smith, John, John Taylor, Robert Menzies, and all these other researchers true. He went to discredit them. He published his book. It's the first accurately, absolutely scientific book about the Giza. It's the very first one, Sir Flinders Petrie. It is so precise in its measurements, verified by Egyptologists today, that even today, Egyptologists only go by the measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie, which were done using a micrometer and a rule to the thousandths of an inch. The reason I am telling you this is because what I'm going to show you is amazing because I've only used the scientific measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie to find what I have found. Everything you see here is Petrie's measurements. Everything done here. These are all the vertical distances right here. Everything is P Sir, Flinders, Sir Flinders Petrie's measurements of all the Grand Gallery, all the passage chambers, all the ascendant, descending chambers, subterranean chamber. We're talking about ceilings, walls, roofs, uh, uh, relieving chambers, every antechamber, everything is here, guys. All the measurements. Here's the sloping. Here's the, here's the horizontal and sloping measurements, all endorsed by engineer David Davidson. These are the measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie. Here's the subterranean chamber. Look at all these measurements. It's amazing, guys. These, are measure, these measurements have shown some pretty profound things. Other people have made uh, very interesting discoveries. <laughs> you can see you can see 31416 at the top. Well, that's pi. That's a ratio of pi right there. You can see phi below it. There's 0.618 right there below it. You can see 618 further down. Another a totally independent message, uh, a measurement. You see a measurement of 0.414 at the bottom. That's, that's Phoenix, 138 times 3. You see the ratio, you see uh, pi, phi, all the, you see every bit of this here. It's a, it's a, these are, these were all discoveries made only after Petrie was able to provide the exact measurements. So that's a short file. I only show the short file because what I'm about to show you should not exist. Sir Flinders Petrie published his material and it literally condemned Charles Piazzi Smith's work, his life work on the Great Pyramid. Astronomer Royale for Scotland's great work on the Great Pyramid. People still read it. They were still interested in it because it was very Christianized. Uh, it gave it filled people with faith. So they still they still re read the book. And, and most people just thought that uh, Sir Flinders Petrie was just a a uh, 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 just just he just did that to discredit him. And in a way, he did. And the scientific community was very was very pleased because now they had a scientist and archaeologist work. Oh, I'm talking about a book that was so packed with calculations and measurements. And now they had work that the entire scientific community across the board absolutely dismissed any idea that the Great Pyramid of Egypt could have been a calendar of the future. They dismissed every bit of it. But this was the idea that was growing in the minds of researchers in the 1850s. 
In the 1860s, books were published about it. In the 1870s, more books perfected the idea with more and more data. And in the 1880, Charles Piazzi Smith, the first scientist and astronomer, published a book about it and showed that, yeah, there, there, is, there, are, there is calendrical anomalies right here in the Great Pyramid. He was accurate on some things, but inaccurate in others because he didn't have the precise measurements. Then we have Sir Flinders Petrie coming behind all of them and totally publishing the correct measurements and data. It's amazing what we find because the measurements are self-referencing over and over and over. The Great Pyramid verifies its own measurements. The geometry can be folded on itself over and over to, to, to precision. I'm glad that we have the measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie or I would have never found what I found and published. All right, before I get into it, I want to do one more audio check because this is going to be a, a little bit longer file. StreamYard doesn't tell me how long I've been running my mouse. Well, somebody, oh yeah, it does. There it is. One hour and 19 minutes. All right, thank you. Good. So, now we're going to get to the juicy juicy, as my buddy Martin says. We got, a, we got a, about three files of juicy juicy stuff. Audio's good. Let's get to it. Now, I'm going to flip through some of these real quick. <clears throat> I'm going to go, I'm just going to go in order because this is a lot to cover. All right. So, Using only the measurements done to a thousand of thousands of inches of, of Sir Flinders Petrie, we find here is an architectural schematic looking at the Great Pyramid from the sky. And this is a bird's eye view looking down on on. This is the location of the King's Chamber and the Antechamber. There's the Great Step where my that's the Great Step right there, which be, which begins the uh, a Grand Gallery. All this right here. So. When we're, when we're looking at these measurements, there are things that, that, that literally jump off, off the page. Jump off the page, guys. So the height of the Great Pyramid, and well, before, before I go into that, I need to tell you something. The antechamber right here has a granite leaf. This was found in the 18, uh, 1880s. The grant in the in the antechamber of the Great Pyramid is this massive granite leaf that has a boss on it. That's what it's called in all the arch architectural books about the Great Pyramid. In the antechamber, on this granite leaf is a boss. The boss has no, no functional use. It, it's only there to draw attention to itself. That boss is almost identical to the modern inch. Almost identical. to. The, it's not quite. It's, it's a micrometer. On a micrometer, you can see the difference. But it's almost identical to the modern inch. In the 1880s, it was widely published that the language of the Great Pyramid, this isn't Jason making this up, this is the 1880s. Those researchers back then said that the Great Pyramid's language was in inches, and it's referring to that boss. That was a, that was a pyramid inch. What we find is interesting because in pyramid, in, in, in just inches period, we find that the height of the Great Pyramid, the platform at the top, and then it starts coming down is 5,448 pyramid inches. That's interesting because that's exactly 552 under 6,000 perfect inches. 552 is a Phoenix cycle. It's 138 times four. In the King's Chamber, Look at, these, look at these distances from the great step, from the surface of the great step to the back of the king's chamber is 534 inches. But the width of the king's chamber is 204 inches. The length of the king's chamber is 412 inches. The height of the king's chamber is 230 inches. Add, add up those dimensions and you have 1380, which is 138 times 10. Yeah, I didn't make this up. All I did was find it. I didn't make any of this up. The king's chamber width of 204 inches, you can see at the top, and the height of 230 inches right there, it's really, it, it, and the length is 412 inches, you see right there, 412 times 204 times 230 is 19,331 and 40. That is the number in cubic inches of the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. 
which is 552 times 35,020, or it's 5,520 times 3,502. The only thing I'm showing you here is that in, spe in space, in the space of the, uh, of, the, of the king's chamber, it is perfectly divisible by the Phoenix cycle number of 552, which is 138 times 4. So we have the height of the, over here on the left, we have the height of the grand gallery is precisely 341 inches right here. The length of the great step, it's a limestone block. It's a single block. It's huge. It's 126 inches long. It's right here. Giant limestone block. Then the 34 inch height from the surface of the block to the conjunct of the, of the 26 degree sloping floor of the Grand Gallery is 34 inches. Then the 52 inch distance of the entrance. This is the entrance into the antechamber. You have to get on your hands and knees to crawl through this 52 inch long area to see that boss. You see the boss on the granite leaf? It's right there. That's the boss. That's what it's called, a boss. That is the unit of measurement used throughout the entire Great Pyramid. Look at this. 340 plus 126 plus 34 plus 56 is exactly 552. Again, it's self-referencing. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up at all. So, and there's many more. I mean, I can't, I, I'm not going to be able to go through all of them. You'll have to go through my playlist. I have many more on the bottom here I'm not even going to get into. All, ki all kinds of, uh, all divisible by 138. Here's the subterranean chamber. You can't make this stuff up. It's right here. The height of the ceiling in the subterranean chamber is 138 inches. It's right here. The width of the ceiling is 552 inches. Can't make that up. It's just crazy. <clears throat> so the length of the subterranean chamber tunnel all the way to the axis conjunct of the, su of the subterranean passage is 1,414 inches, which is 1,000 plus a cursed earth period, or 138 times 3. However, if you add this 1,414 inches to the vertical distance from the base of the pyramid to the ceiling of, of, the, of the chamber, which is 1,070 inches, you get 2,484. Remember, Aristarchus said that the world is destroyed every 2,484 years, which is 138 times 18. If you add, if you add this 2484 years to 552 inch width of the of the of the ceiling where the 1070 inch uh, measurement stopped, you get 3036 inches, which is 138 times 22. The reason that's interesting is because the descending passage right here to the right is 3036 inches in length, as I'll show you. So we have so there's many more guys. I can't, I'm not gonna be able to talk to them all. Here it is right here. There it is. That is 3,036 inches in length from here it is from the conjunct right here at the bottom of the subterranean floor floor joint between the descending passage and the the uh, the uh, horizontal floor. 3,036 inches all the way to the axis between the ascending and descending passage right here. You can't make that up. It's right there. Look at the pyramid foundation is right here. It is exactly 1,656 inches to this great massive slab that is the floor of the king's chamber right there. Why is that important? Because 1,656 inches is 138 feet. That's why it's important. Right here, the distance of, of the subterranean, I mean, excuse me, the distance of the king's chamber floor, this giant slab, is 534 inches. 534 inches plus the 846 inch height of the queen's chamber floor is 1,380 inches. Right there. It's self-referencing. 138 times 10. Can't make that up. Look at the look at the grand gallery, the grand gallery height. I mean, the distance of the ceiling on the grand gallery is 1,836 inches, right there. But the grand gap, but that ends right here. 
exactly 1,200 inches to the foundation level of the Great Pyramid. This measurement is right here. It's self-referencing. 1836 inches plus 1,200 inches is 3,036, which is 138 times 22, which is the same distance here as the subterranean deal. You can't make this stuff up. This, no architects today could have built with this precision. The entire monument, there are hundreds of examples, the entire monument is self-referencing, guys. If you put the capstone back on the pyramid at the very top, the pyramid would be 5,814 inches because we know where, where geometrically the top is. You can't see it today. There's a flat platform up there, but the chief cornerstone would be massive, massive. If we put it back in place, the height would be 5,814 inches. How do we know this? Because mathematically, the pyramid is 51 degrees. 51 degrees on one side and 51 degrees on the other side gives us our geometrical height of the pyramid, which is 5,814 inches high. Added to the floor of the king's chamber, 534 inches, as you see on the left, gives us the number 6,348. That is 138 times 46. If you take the height of the pyramid geometrically, if the, if the stone was in place at 5,814 inches and you subtract the 846-inch height of the queen's chamber floor right here, you get a really interesting number. You get 4968. Mylar Cakes veterans know that number. 4968, Annis Mundi was a phoenix year. It was a destructive year. It's also 138 times 36. So I showed you the 138-foot height of this slab. This slab at the king's chamber is 138 feet above the foundation of the pyramid. That added to the 34 inch height of the end of the slab from the bottom of the descent of the grand gallery, 34 inches added to the vertical distance underneath the pyramid where that 1656 started all the way to the ceiling of the subterranean chamber, which is itself 552 inches in width. If you add those together, you get 2760 right here. 2760 is 552 times 5. It's divisible by 138. And if you add it, the 552 inches of the, of the ceiling, the width of the subterranean chamber, you get the number 3312. 3312 Annus Mundi was the year 583 BC when Thales of Miletus predicted the darkening of the sun. It was a phoenix year. There are so many of these guys. So many. Here is the six. Here you see down here, that app is irritating the hell out of me. Here is the 1656, 1656 vertical height, 138 feet to the king's chamber floor. Here's the vertical distance from the foundation of the pyramid to the ceiling of the subterranean chamber, 1,070 feet. Here is the length, 1,414 feet of the subterranean chamber. That's the length right there. You can't see it. There it is right there. That's the length. Add them all together. You get 4,140. What is that? It's 10 cursed earth periods of 414 years each. Or or it's 40 times 138, the Phoenix number. Over and over and over, everywhere, self-referencing, all throughout the pyramid. Here it is. The vertical east-west, uh, uh, north-south axis of the pyramid is in the dead center. It is the face of the great it is the face of the great step right here. This is the center of the pyramid. It goes down the center of the queen's chamber. That's what it does. It goes down here. It goes all the way up to the top of the pyramid. That is... The center axis of the pyramid is 4,554. Look at the top of the screen. It's 4,554 inches away from the base perimeter of the monument. Right there. Which is 1518 times 3. Both of these numbers are divisible by 138. But 1518 is another measurement that's found right here. The central axis conjunct for the descending passage and the ascending passage is right here. 
And it is precisely 15, 18 vertical inches to the perimeter of the Great Pyramid. You'll see 15, 18 appearing here again, because 15, 18 is 15, 18 times two is 3,036 right there. Self-referencing 3,036, 15, 18 plus 15, 18. Over and over throughout the structure, it was the it was the design of the structure to draw your attention to the Phoenix number of 138. There can be no other explanation as to why all these measurements are self-referencing over and over and over being divisible by 138 if it wasn't the principal message of the monument to draw your attention to this number. The 144th course, which the builders would have known the, that a civilization in the future would have been advanced enough to know that 144, 12 times 12, is a Fibonacci number. So, it's very interesting that the 144th course of blocks to the Great Pyramid is 4,140 inches in height from the foundation of the pyramid. Again, it is 40 the number of trial and testing times 138, the Phoenix number. Now there's no, there, there's, there's, I'm, I'm moving on guys. There's a bunch of these I'm skipping. Like at the bottom down here, how you, how you calculate to the year 1902 AD is in the pyramid. We'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that in a little while. I'm still trying to get through these, to these deals. So look at this. You can't make this stuff up. If you take the length right here, of the king's chamber floor slab, it is 534 surface inches, floor surface inches. I've showed this, and it's, and it's exactly 138 feet above the foundation of the pyramid. You can't make this stuff up. But what's even more intriguing is that if you continue down the entire length of the grand gallery, which is perfectly even with the, with the ascendant passage all the way to the end of, of the passage, which is 3,361, uh, uh, it's a sloping distance, uh, uh, inches. All you do is add 3,361 to 534. That's all you got to do, guys. You add 534 inches starting at the pyramid and going all the way down to 3,361, and you get the number 3,895. What is 38, what is 3,895? 3895 BC was the Phoenix year of the Adam and Eve reset. My archaics veterans know I don't have to talk about it. You already know how many videos and all the all the data I have in my published books about year one. Not only me, other chronologists say year one was 3895. Was it the beginning of the world? Hell no. It was the Adam and Eve reset, a cataclysm that was so terrible that mankind actually believed a new heavens and new earth had appeared. 3895 BC was a phoenix year. It started the 138 year countdown of the pre flood world of 1656 years to the great flood. Can't make this stuff up. What was the pyramid built to do? According to Sureed, the cops, according to, according to the hermetical literature, according to the, the, uh, uh, ancient uh, Arabic, Arabic historians, and, and we'll see that here in a minute, the great pyramid was specifically built to survive the great flood. So that a future generation in the last days would be able to decode certain information. These are the traditions attached to the Great Pyramid. The architect was supposed to be Hanok, known to us as Enoch, and later called Thoth, later called Hermes, but, but the, it's the same design. Divine messages were encoded into a piece of architecture that was specifically designed to be to to survive the end of a world and live all the way to the end of the next world and yet serve some type of utilitarian function for that generation in the last days. Remember, Enoch was not a prophet in his time. Enoch's ministry was for the last days. So, oh, here's. Uh, the Phoenix appears called, uh, this is 3895 BC, volcanic resurfacing, continental quakes, oceans slipping over their basins, whole colonies of human survivors from the world before, they're now erased. 3895 BC reset begins, the Genesis story making Phoenix as a fiery revolving blade that ends Eden. This begins the 6,000 year countdown till the next major reset. We're not talking about 
Oh, we're not we're not talking about something simple as as simple as the Phoenix phenomenon or Nemesis X. We are talking about a systemic reset, and this is what this is what the Adam and Eve deal was. So, the Great Pyramid of Giza preserves thirty eight ninety five not ninety five year period till the calendar change, and it did change. It's called the Anno Domini calendar. In our programming, that became year one of AD. This is thirty eight ninety five BC. So that's sixteen fifty six years, or one hundred and thirty eight feet to to the to the uh, vertical distance to the king's chamber. That identifies twenty two thirty nine BC. If you use thirty eight ninety five BC and you simply add the one thousand six hundred and fifty six years of the pre flood world found in the book of Genesis, mentioned by Rashi, Moses, Maimonides, chrono uh, biblical chronologist Stephen Jones, my own calculations. If you just take the simple sixteen fifty six years of the pre flood world and you add them to the thirty eight ninety five BC date, you get twenty two thirty nine BC as a Phoenix year, but it's also the year of the great flood of Noah, twenty two thirty nine BC. Now I've got I've got I, there's no this video is not trying to prove that. I care less if you believe it or not. It's 2239 BC is 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 a uh, is so supported with so many data sets, published books, uh, so so many ancient authors that to me it's not even debatable. But if somebody wanted to debate it, we can definitely do it. 2239 BC was the Great Flood of Noah. It is literally a all my archaics veterans know it is literally a chronological and scientifically established fact. So uh, here we have. The darkening of the sun, meteoric rain, red mud, geological upheavals, and whole land masses sank beneath the oceans. Every civilization was reset, and numerous new calendars suddenly appeared in the old Bronze Age at this day. Remember, the vapor canopy collapsed, the new sun calendars appeared, and uh, life continued. There was a bunch of survivors. So 2239 B.C. was 1656 years after 3895 B.C. reset pole shift by Phoenix, and 414 years after the 2653 B.C. ruin of the Indus Valley civilization, which was also caused by the Phoenix. Mohenjo-Daro is again destroyed. So here we have some evidence that the concept, the concept of the pyramid, the phoenix, which was described as a dragon in the ancient world, and the number 138 all merge in the ancient Americas. When, after the cataclysm, people went to different areas of the world, they took their belief systems with them. Their belief systems were incorporated into their architecture. Here in Mexico, we find a pyramid that has 138 dragon heads. Here it is. Serpent heads. Yeah, it's called serpent heads. Serpents were also cycles. Remember, I've told you this over and over. Serpents are the are the symbols in the ancient world to cycles. And when the cycle is over, the serpent eats its tail. The cycle's complete. When you have serpents undulating, that means the, the age or the cycle continues. Well, here's 138 cycles attached to the idea of a pyramid. Now, perhaps it's a coincidence, but this pyramid is 138 meters high. Can't make this stuff up. We live, we live, I tell you guys all the time, we live in the simulacrum. I said it right. We live in the simulacrum, guys, the holosphere. And you're always going to find self-referencing everywhere. So, <clears throat> yeah, here's more Great Pyramid stuff all these all these red circles are all measurements by sir flinders petrie that show he didn't know anything about the phoenix phenomenon he didn't even know anything about the importance of the number 138 but all these measurements are divisible if they're circled in red they're divisible by 138 all in here guys look at these all divisible by 138 there's 2070 right there i can't see what the one on the bottom is. oh 336 all divisible by 138 Every boxed measurement is divisible by 138, right here. There's a lot of them. We just went through this one a minute ago. It's a whole bunch of them. So we have a 41-story stone structure of laser precision tolerances scientifically measured to contain a coating based of rectilinear distances of units all divisible by 138. 
a holospheric template of the future built over 48 centuries ago. No other pyramids in the world replicate this, this feature, this self-referencing feature, this, this, this attention to the number 138, these ascending grand galleries and chambers and, and relieving chambers. None of this is, this is the only pyramid in the world that does this. So, the Great Pyramid of Giza is a crystalline geopolymer resonance generator carrying out a 138-year cataclysm protocol that only activates when humanity is found enlightened or advanced. Now, I wrote this a long time ago. I, I still kind of, I still kind of lean lean that way and believe it. I've made more discoveries about about it, but the Great Pyramid is highly, it's highly discriminating. 2239 BC, Old Bronze Age Cataclysm was 350 years before Means. In the Sumerian text, his name is Anum. He's also named Anum in the Book of Jasher. But Means arrives in Egypt in 1889 BC. This is right after the Egyptian Intermediate Period. Intermediate periods in Egypt is when e Egyptologists, they're not going to say there was a great flood. The Egyptologists, all they're going to admit to is that here's a 300-year period for which we have no history. Sounds like a flood to me, but it's okay. It's okay. We, 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 we can forgive them of their uh, inability to go into detail. So... <clears throat> So here's the floor of the king's chamber to the Great Step central axis of pyramid is 534 inches, which is 1656 inches above the pyramid baseline. The grand gallery from the central axis step down here, down here, is 3,361 inches. This 534 added to the, th the 3361, like I showed you, is 3895 inches. This would be 3895 BC, which we know of as year one of the Phoenix calendar of the pre-flood world. Now, the Deluge reset was 1656 years later in 2239 BC. At the end of the 3895 years starts the Anno Domini calendar that we're in now. But we've I've already showed you it really didn't start till after 526 AD to hide the 552 year Phoenix cycle. But that's a whole that's a whole different video. So this is just showing you. Oh, at the bottom I've got a a gigantic rectilinear holographic template disguised as architecture that either empowered or is disguised to disrupt the Phoenix weapon. This is theory. This is where actual fact bleeds off into conjecture. I'm not sure exactly what all this means. I'm telling you that now. But what I'm telling you is factual is that the scientific measurements of the Great Pyramid are screaming at you to look at the Phoenix cycle. Look at the Phoenix phenomenon. Look at the number 138 and where it leads to. So <clears throat> now here's what's interesting about Charles Piazzi Smith in the 1880s calculated that the descendant passage pointed at Alpha Draconis in the year 3440. This is, a, this is an approximate in 3430 BC. Smith knew nothing about the Nemesis X object, the Anunnaki, none of that. He sure didn't know that in 3439 BC, the Nemesis X object killed one third of the world. In the book of Jasher, it said the center of destruction was the Gihon area. Gihon area is the Nile. It is it is the Great Pyramid area. area. Here's Alpha Draconis, the Eye of the Dragon, the ancient pole star when the pyramid was built. Here it is right here. This is during during the, the uh, uh, pre-flood world. Now, 3439 BC is really interesting because if I if memory serves me correct, let me see something real quick, real quick. 3439 BC minus the 531 inches of the king's floor that I showed you. Yeah, that's right. It's 2905. 2905 BC. 2905 BC was year one of pyramid construction. I show that in my Chronicon. Maybe I got some charts in here that show it. Here's biblical chronologist Stephen Jones' book. The appendix in the back of the secrets of time. 
it shows even he doesn't know anything about the Phoenix. He has never communicated with me. I don't know anything. He doesn't know anything about my research other than when other people pointed out because I'm aware they sent him emails. But he has, he has not wanted to do a collaboration with me, and I'm cool with that. But in his research, which is very meticulous, he shows 3895 B.C. as year one. This is the Adam and Eve reset. His research is absolutely independent of mine. Emmanuel Velikovsky, uh, uh, cryptolog cryptologist R.A. Bole, uh, Rashi, Moses Maimonides, and so many others who, who have this year date, year one, 3895 B.C. He used the Book of Jasher, Assyrian eponyms, the Book of Jubilees, and Genesis to do his dating. Again, 1656 years in world history is the, is the Great Flood. Uh, here's the uh, Kali Yuga calendar. 3103 B.C. is 1656 years before the Exodus in 1447 B.C. And the ten plagues of Egypt, which started a mass exodus away from all this area. Uh, we're just going, this is more, we're just going, let me get through these. Again, circled in red, it's divisible by 138, divisible by 138. Here's the Phoenix timeline. You, many of you have seen this. So the Great Pyramid is basically, if you were to take the Great Pyramid as an architectural calendar and lay it all out in the arithmetic that is demonstrating, this is what you get. This is what you get right here. Look at 3895 BC right here on the left. Every 138 years, there's 1656 years of the vapor canopy world. There's the Great Flood, 2239 BC. 138 years, 138 years, you get 1963 BC. We have Phoenix records for that day. Look, 138 years, 138 years. Get rid of that. And there you got, I've got five videos on 1687 BC. It is the flood of Ogyges. There it is. 138 years going all through time, all the way over here till we get to 1902. And then 2040. There it is right there. So, <clears throat> now, here's, here's the Phoenix timeline. Redistrib redistributed. It's still 100. And all these events are still 138 years apart. But look at it now. The pre-flood world is 1656 years. There it is at the left on the bottom. But you have a Phoenix cycle to the Ogygian Deluge. There it is. The Ogygian Deluge also started a vapor canopy for 25 years. There it is. But it starts 1656 year cycle all the way to what? Here it is. 31 BC. The, the total ruin of the Americas, the last date on an Olmec date steel, a uh, fiery red dragon appeared over Egypt. You guys know, you, archaics veterans, Phoenix veterans, you already know the, the history. There it is right there, 1656 years. And then look, another Phoenix cycle, 552 years to what? 522 A.D. That is when our calendar for the Anno Domini really began. The AD calendar we're on right now began because of this event. When Phoenix appeared, it started the Justinian darkness, Justinian plagues, 25 years of darkness, all kinds of fallout all over the world. This started, this is the beginning of the Dark Age. It was a huge reset. I have a video that shows that the Roman Catholic Church specifically created the Anno Domini calendar to hide the event of the, that happened right here. But look at this. Oh my God, what did it start? 1656 years. There it is. It started at 1656 years to total simulacrum collapse, 2178 BC. There is the Phoenix Challenge number. There's the, the immortal number, 2178. Those new to my channel don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Archaics veterans, there's your number, 2178. Remember that guy in India that tried to prove, the, prove, the, prove that 2178 does collapse? He's still on YouTube. He analyzed that number and he came around and said, hey, man, Jason's absolutely correct. This is an immortal number. It does not collapse. And this number does show that we are in a simulated environment. Here it is. It's on the 138-year timeline. More, more. Uh, so here we go through this real fast. All of these are divisible by 138. I have so many charts. We just can't go through them. You need to go through the playlist. We just got too many to go through and not enough time. These are all divisible by 138, all these different calculations. And you can go, you can go see more of this. This is this is a lot more data on the Phoenix phenomenon. There's a lot packed into this chart. A whole lot. These are all the Phoenix dates and what, what happened. And and 
Uh, on the sidebar over here is a lot more proof that we live in a hologram. Uh, this type, this type of, uh, I mean, these dates are all confirmed by multiple. Remember, if something is true, you will always be able to see it from multiple different mathematical vantage points. I'm always hammering this into my community. And same thing with this chart here. There's a bunch of different arithmetic ways to see what the end date is. Here's 2040 right here. There's all kinds of species of analysis to show how it's possible. It's not just the 138-year timeline, isometric projections, all kinds of pi and pi and phi projections all show 2040 is a big Phoenix event in our timeline. It's 16.5 years from now. So Here's a bunch of ancient calendar sources, ancient texts and historians that all verify that the Great Flood happened in 2239 B.C. This is very important because these are not modern authors. All these right here are ancient authors. And when you use the calendars that were known to them in their life, those calendars all equal up to our, our year of 2239 B.C. Again, this is an overview. You need to go through the presentations to, to see that. Here's the 1656 years vapor canopy pre-flood world on our timeline. Here it is. We're way over here. All you see the black arrows over here to the 2040 return of the vapor canopies way back here. Again, here's the 1656 years. Look, 1656 years vapor canopy. Here's a 552 year Phoenix cycle. 1656 years. Again, 1656 years. There's a lot of lot to unpack also also in this in this uh, uh chart here but these charts are here i got these charts everywhere and uh so the entire ascending passage from here all this gr the gallery and the king's chamber distance precisely 3895 inches where it ends at the descending passage conjunct the bc timeline collapsing into the ce or the anno domini timeline at the exact chronometrical location that forms the year 5796 all that is shown in here. I've shown this in multiple charts. 5796 is our year of 1902. This is important because the internal, the internal countdown of the Great Pyramid shifts from 1902 in uh, from the 1902 to the external. And I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Uh, this is another, this is just the Phoenix timeline. Again, we've already seen all this. Okay, we've seen all this. These are all just different. These are all, all rectilinear measures. Look at this. This is out of Chronicon. This is the year of pyramid construction beginning. It is the year 2905 BC. Pyramid construction begins. Look at the top left. It is the year 990 Annus Mundi. Right there. Which is 666 years before the flood. Which is 534 years from the descent of the Watchers in 3439 BC. This is right here. 534 is the distance, is the linear distance in inches of the king's chamber. Great Pyramid is a calendar. There it is, 534. Long. There's the height. All we got. Well, I've already gone through a bunch of these. There's the vapor canopy period right here. 1656 years of the vapor canopy right there. That's the world history chart. Assimilating a whole bunch of different ancient calendars. Here it is, the 1656 years. In the Phoenix timeline, right there. All this is in the Great Pyramid. So let me check my chat before we go to the next amazing file. This is the 2040 file. You've seen you've seen the evidence now of 138 being patterned everywhere in the rectilinear measurements done to the thousandth of an inch by a scientist. Now I'm going to show you where the where the year 2040 comes up over and over and over in the Great Pyramid. You just can't make that up. That's right, Donna, Donna Marie Farrell. Quote me. You just can't make this shit up. Thank you, Mr. C, for that public archive. One hour and 56 minutes. Oh, we got time. We got time. Let's do it. Let's get this done. All right. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, I am flying. This coffee got me wired up. Hmm. All right. All right. So we're going to the next file.
Oh yeah, it's getting good. Getting so here's here's a here's a here's a deal I, I designed a long time ago. It's in my pyramid. I'm gonna go ahead and read it for you. One of these giant pyramids contains within its rectilinear measurements the golden proportion phi and pi or three three point one four one six curvature equations palindromes the three hundred and sixty five point two five solar year lunar cycles tolerances of laser precision unique upper chambers no other pyramids in the world contain and an encoded geometrical timeline exhibiting from several dimensions of arithmetic the future date on our calendar of may 2040. The other pyramid is a decoy. If you want to understand what I'm talking about, why they needed a decoy, you need to watch, you need to watch that my pyramid playlist. Now, first of all, I just made a claim. I just made a claim right here. Many, many published books have already established all these facts about pi, phi, curvature equations, laser precision tolerances. I don't need to prove that. It's already been proven in, in over a thousand books in French, German, English, Spanish. This is already widely known. But I just made a hell of a claim. I'm telling you that the message of the Great Pyramid is about the year 2040 on our calendar. That's a hell of a claim, guys. So I'm going to tell you right now that as I uh, I hold the same standard uh, to myself that I, I hold to others, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, I've already gone through a lot of the evidence by showing you that I'm only going by the scientifically accepted measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie and modern day Egyptologists. I'm only going by those measurements. And yet only going by those measurements, I just exploded with data showing you where not only is the number 138 everywhere in the Great Pyramid, in probably many examples that I have not yet found, but it's also self-referencing. So, let's move. Look at this chart here. Going only by the scientific measurements, only by the scientific measurements, if we start with the ancient Olmec calendar of uh, which started in 3373 BC. If we start with this old Olmec calendar, this is an ancient American calendar, 3373 BC. And we follow only, only the rectilinear distances right here. We get to the year 2965 BC. Here it is right here. 2965 BC, 3373 BC is the back wall of, uh, of the side wall of the King's Chamber here. It's the end of this long slab. We get, we, it takes us all the way down this slab, 408 inches before we get to the limestone 126 inch block, 408 inches takes us to 2965 BC when according to the book of Jasher, the sun darkened and Adam died. I don't know if Adam really died or not, but it said the sun darkened on that day. That's Phoenix phenomenon material. It says 2965 BC, Adam died at 930 years old. I don't believe that. I believe that's a calendar code, but that's okay. We can move on. 126 years later is 2839 BC. 2839 BC is a part of the Anunnaki Nur calendar system of, of great years of 600 year periods. My archaics veterans need no explanation. You know about the 600 year calendar. This is 2839 BC. What happened to 2839 BC? The seven kings overthrew the matriarch. And they began to rule the seven kings of Sumer on the on the Sumerian king list. They began to rule in this this day. They maintained their rule all the way to the flood. They overturned a matriarch in doing this. Oh, matriarchal rule in twenty eight thirteen. This is also the first year of Noah. Noah was born in this year. Follow this. Follow this calculation. Three thousand. 360 inches all the way down, you get to 522 AD. Now you have to understand this distance of 3,360 inches, according to engineer David Davidson and Sir Flinders Petrie, is actually two distances. And that's because of the width of the floor. One side is one inch longer than the other. So you have a measurement of 3,360 inches on the on one side of the floor, and you have 3,361 inches on the other. But the mean in the middle would be 3,000 three would be 3,360.5 inches. When you're dealing with thousands of inches that that were all measured to the thousands of an inch, all these rectilinear distances, it becomes important important because we're talking about calendars. And when we get to this distance, what does it get to? Look at the passage axis 
conjunct. That distance gives us 522 AD. That is a Phoenix year that started the Dark Ages. It also started the Anno Domini calendar. It is precisely 15, 18, 1,518 inches from the vertical, look at, look at this, horizontal distance between verticals. The vertical axis conjunct to the vertical of the, of the end of the Great Pyramid, the terminus of, of the architecture is precisely 1,518 inches. 1,518 plus 522 AD is 2040. Look at this. The year... <coughs> excuse me. The year 3195 BC starts here. My archives veterans can tell you what that year is. It's in Chronicon. Right here, it's 230 inches, the height of the king's chamber. It's 230 inches to 2965. Again, the sun darkens. Phoenix phenomenon, which is 534 inch distance to the great step, which is the central axis of the whole monument. Right here, gives us 2431 BC. You'll have to look at Chronicon. I can't remember that date. Here it is, 1814 Inches to the axis of the end of the Grand Gallery it gives us six. It gives us six seventeen BC. This is a date important to Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, right here. But three hundred and forty inches down this vertical axis to the floor gives us nine fifty seven BC. This concerns King Solomon and the Temple. Now. 1,546 inches, which, which completes the 3,360 inches to the end, gives us 930 A.D. or 930.5 A.D. It's right here. That's very interesting. You'll have to look in Chronicon to see what happened in 930 A.D., but 1,110 inches to the exit of the pyramid, the floor exit right here, gives us 2040. I didn't make this up, and I didn't measure any of this. It's all right here. Look at this. At the passage axis con conjunct right here, if we start with 1855 B.C., we start right here. Something to do with Sodom and Gomorrah or, oh, no, Nemesis X object appears. 1855 B.C., we start here, and we go up 3,360 inches to the central axis conjunct to the whole pyramid in time and add 534 inches, which is 534 years added to 3,360 years from 1855 BC, we get 2040 AD. Anybody can do the math. Anybody can do the cal with a calculator. Now, I'm wondering why this 2965, oh, 2965 is what we started. The sun darkens right here. I didn't realize that. That's what it is. It started with the sun darkening in 2965 BC before the flood and then and then uh, taking away 1,110 inches, which is the length of this floor down here, gets us to 1855 BC, the appearance of the Nemesis X object. Then minus 3,360 years, then minus 500, and, uh, I mean, then adding, excuse me, adding, uh, going forward in time through the BC system gets us to 2040 right here. <coughs> Again, we're talking about something that is self-referencing. From the base, from the base of the pyramid structure all the way to the top of the slab. Remember, the bottom of the slab is 138 feet, but the top of the slab is 1,700 inches. It's 34 inch diff difference. So here we got. Here we have 1,700 inches to the top of this massive slab. The floor of the Grand Gallery is exactly 340 inches in height to the ceiling of the Grand Gallery that goes all the way down. If you simply add these two vertical heights, it's just a simple adding of the two vertical, two vertical architectural heights right here is 2040. And again, the length of the length of this entire ceiling of 1836 inches of the grand gallery added to the 204 inch width of the king's chamber the architecture is self referencing at 2040 1836 plus 24 
204 is 2040. Well, I don't think I added this, but the Tetractus is the number. The pyramid identifies the number 10 or the Tetractus. So if you take the 51 degree angle of the Great Pyramid, it's, it's at, let me go back to the 51 degrees. I think I had it. Yeah. You see this 51 degrees? 51 degrees times four faces is 204. But 204 times the Tetractus, which is the number 10, it's the symbol for the number 10, gives you 2040. Here's where it gets a little bit more complex. Do you see this whole, this, this, this geometrical form down here formed by the entrance of the Great Pyramid? Here it is at the bottom. Here it is at the bottom. This is a really interesting form, kind of ones you wonder, kind of makes you wonder where we got some of our, like the Sumerian symbol for the Netaru, the gods. It's very interesting. So we have all these rectilinear measurements done, done to the thousandth of an inch. They provide 176, 1,110, 666 inch, six, uh, vertical height to the entrance, sloping distance of 808 inches from the perimeter of the pyramid to the entrance, the, the sloping distance, and then the horizontal distance from the perimeter of the pyramid to the axis conjunct, conjunct right here that's 176 inches high. This is 1,518 inches. The height of 138 feet or 1,656 inches to the king's chamber slab. Added all these together is 2040. It's 2040 if you add them all together. The Great Pyramid is a calendar. It's a calendar in stone. Here's a different way to do it. Here's a totally different way to do it. All different kinds of ways to do it, really. There's the Olmec calendar, 3373 BC, ancient American calendar, minus 408 right there, equals darkening of the sun, slab to 20. Okay, we already see, seen this, but in a different way, presented in a different way. But yeah, it's self referencing. Here's, a new, here's one right here. Oh, okay. This is a, just a better illustration showing. Here's the darkening of the sun, 2965 BC, 1,110 inches to 1855 BC. Nemesis X object appears, 3,360 inches all the way over here to the central axis conjunct of the entire pyramid, which divides it in equal halves north and south, adding 534 years for the length of the king's chamber slab is 5934. 5934 Annus Mundi is the year 2040 AD. Great Pyramid is a calendar. Here is, here is the start of the Sumerian king list, 670 years, which I've showed you on the Sumerian king list. It is 241,200 shards, which is precisely divided by 360 to be 670 years evenly. That started in 2909 BC. That's the perimeter of the pyramid. And going up 808 eight inches, sloping inches, gives us 2101 BC. It's a phoenix year on the 138-year timeline. Now going down the full length, the full length of the subterranean chamber from the perimeter of the pyramid right here is 4,146 inches to the passage axis conjunct right here, which this arrow shows. Adding all that together is 5934 AM. It's a totally different way of seeing the same thing. 5934 Annus Mundi is our year 2040. And this is interesting because this distance of 4146 is the same as 4140 because this red line represents a passage that has that that is 4,100 it's 4,140 inches on one side and it slopes to 4,146 inches on another. Same thing the ascendant passage did. The end the end ramp literally slopes to provide two measurements. The architect knew exactly what he was doing. So look at this 957 BC. Concerning uh, the temple, uh, uh, the well, the narrative of the temple in Jerusalem, 957 BC, I believe, was when Pharaoh Shishak, Shishank or Shishank invaded Palestine and took all their all their stuff. You'll have to look. Chronicon will tell you 957 BC. 
is where we start right here on the Grand Gallery vertical axis right here. Third, 340 years later, 340 inches is 617 BC. This is a, a very important date to, in date to uh, very important date to to Palestine concerning Babylon. This is 617 BC right here. Going all the way down this entire, what is this? Uh, 1,546 inches, just this passage length right here gives us 930 AD. 930 AD plus 1,110 inches gives us 2040 again. It's right here. It's just a different way of seeing the, the same, the end result, what we saw earlier. All right, let's go to, let's go to a more epic, All right, you guys still with me? We're going to go to an epic file now. I'm going to the bottom of the chat so I can see what's going on. Bottom of the chat. Rose Hermeticus. When you add them all up, it provides the Annus Mundi year. The Annus Mundi year is 5934. Anybody looks in Chronicon or any of my published books and all my chronologies and all my other charts, if you look, 5934 is our year 2040 in the Anno Domini calendar. 50, no, 5934 is Annus Mundi, but it equals 2040 in Anno Domini. All my archaics veterans know that. Let's get to uh let's get to this file. I don't want to keep the good people waiting. I know you guys got soap operas and, and comedies and things you want to watch. Let me get let me get to this. Let me get the business out. We got two epic files to go through. So here, here you can see. Remember, everything is self-referencing. Anything that is true is self-referencing, and it can be seen from multiple different mathematical vantage points. Here you see a chart of the pre-flood world. All these ancient calendars that basically started at the same time. Here they are. The Maya Itza Temple of the Cross is at the top. Started 3121 B.C. Again, we have 3113 B.C. Uh, in some calendars, 3114 B.C. for the Mayan calendar. It's right here. Oh, we have 3102 BC for the Brahmanic Kali Yuga calendar, or 3103 BC, depending upon uh, which model you use. It's very close. We have 3100 BC for the Sumerian Etana myth. It's 3100 BC is also Egyptian long chronology count. 3100 BC is the accepted date for most of the urban development that all happened in the ancient world all about this time. All these calendars are built, but if you look down here at the bottom, you find out in the biblical chronology, this is during the life of Enoch. Enoch was who? He was a chronologist. He was a, he built, he, he designed calendars. He was a architect. He was a teacher. He was a mathematician. He was what? He's a prophet. So this is Enoch. Now, by the time the Great Pyramid is built, right here in 2815 B.C., after 90 years, you see in Chronicon, the pyramid begins in 2905 B.C. It takes 90 years to build the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is finished in 2815 B.C., and I've shown this by multiple different species of analysis. This is when it was finished. 90 years is 1,080 months. It's 1080 months. This is where it gets really interesting. The Great Pyramid is literally is literally built 300 years after a civilization had adopted several calendars, several different calendars. What does this tell us? It tells us that post-reset, after the Gihon destruction that killed a third of the world's population in 3439 BC, the world had recovered. The world had moved on. They have a massive infrastructure. There's a huge political shakeup, and the matriarchy is basically weakened. Patriarchy takes over. The, the seven Anunnaki kings begin, begin ruling the, the, the five cities of, 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 of the Sumerian Pentopolis which was Bad Tabira, Larak, Shurapak, and two others. I can't remember what they were. But uh, this, this takeover happens, and the Great Pyramid is finished around the 290, 300th year of this civilization, meaning technology has already become 
uh, old. Knowledge is becoming old. Remember, it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. In the ancient world, it may have taken them less time. We've been technologically advanced before. How do we know? Because the Great Pyramid is still standing there, and we can't build one today. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because the number 1080 is connected to the Great Pyramid. Not only did it take 1080 months to build, 90 years, but 2815 BC is the year 1080 Annus Mundi. That's the year 1080 right there, Annus Mundi. It's 1,000. 1,080 years since the Adam and Eve reset destroyed the entire world and started year one. Here's a better, well, here's a much better chart. I don't know why I was looking at that chart. This is a much better chart showing the same thing. All these ancient calendars and, and all these belief systems, Scorpion King, Egyptian Narmer, Sumerian Etana, who was Enoch, all this right here was basically the same period of time. Here it is right here. 300-year reign of Enoch, according to the book of Jasher, 300 years in the pre-flood world at 360 days a year was 108,000 days. Here it is, 1080 again. Here's 1080, Great Pyramid finished after 90 years, 1080 months. It is finished in the year 1080. That's self-referencing, but we're going to go further than that. Here's the Egyptian Coptic date. 2844 uh, for pyramid construction. And it's true. It was the 61st year of, of pyramid construction. This whole period of time, the pyramid's being built. Right here, guys. Yeah. Noah was born while the pyramid was being built. It's right here in the chronology. So, the descriptions we have for the Pillar of Enoch are right here. The word pyramid is new. The ancient world did not know the word pyramid. This is, this is the word that we basically invented to describe the structure, the structures. But this, in the traditions, this is this is what the pillar of Enoch looked like. So here's the altar of Agni, represented as stepped pyramid with white pyramids. See all these white pyramids here? This is the altar of Agni. Why is that important? Because I've shown you, and I'm going to show you again, that the Great Pyramid was also called an altar in the Bible. So, uh. Pyramid derived from an old root meaning fire. The altar of Agni was a fire altar in the Hindu system. Altar of the Lord in the land of Egypt. This is the book of Isaiah. I'm, I'm going to find a better reference than that. Here's the ladder of Set in the book of the dead. Yeah, guys. Great pyramid was known, but, but, the, but what happened was... There's no written records that survived from the time that the Great Pyramid was built. So it was only preserved in different cultural traditions. This is the Ladder of Set in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Oh, by the way, why is it important that it's the Ladder of Set? Who is Set in ancient Egypt? I've shown you the text. I've shown you the books. Set is Typhon. Who is Typhon? Typhon is the fiend. It's the phoenix. Over and over, I've showed, my archaic veterans already know, over and over, you have seen evidence that Typhon and Phoenix are interchangeable. Why is this important here? Because this is the ladder of Set. This is the ladder of Typhon. This is the ladder of the Phoenix. That's why you find the number 138 in it everywhere. New Testament reads that Abram looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. The only place he would have ever looked for a city that was described as such is right here. And remember, Abram did go to Egypt. Heraclitus wrote that the world is destroyed every, oh, every 10,800 years. This is how information is preserved in fragments and traditions. Here's the Rig Veda. Rig Veda is, a, is the ancient Vedas, is the books. Rig Veda me, literally means altar of knowledge. Anybody who has researched Hindu studies can tell you this. Altar of knowledge is what Rig Veda means. Rig Veda is the, the 144,000 stanzas of the ancient Hindu scriptures. So I think it's 144,000. Somebody can correct me. Or 432,000 stanzas, which is 144,000 times three. Same thing as a Mayan Bakhtin, 144,000 days, or, or a Kali Yuga, 432,000 uh, days. 
So this is the Rig Veda, altar of knowledge of Brahma. Brahma, who is Brahma? Brahma is married. His consort is, is Saraswati. This is no different than Genesis. It's Abraham and Sarah. It's Abram and Sarah. Where'd they go? They went to Egypt. Why'd they go to Egypt? Because they went to look for a city whose builder and maker was God. So Abram, Brahma, got associated to Egypt and the altar. It's all right here. And Rig Veda, altar of knowledge of Brahma, has 10,800 stanzas in 10 books. That's in 10 books of 1,080 stanzas each. It's all preserved right here. Great Pyramid finished in 2815 BC or 1080 Annus Mundi. 666 years before the Great Flood. The four-faced Brahma was underwater for a while. This is in Hindu tradition. What is Brahma, who is married to a woman, so therefore he's a man, what is he doing with four faces? And if he has four faces, what is he doing underwater, under the sea for a while? In Hindu tradition, the four-faced Brahma was a literal memory of the Great Pyramid being, being underwater for a while. Brahma, Abram, had four faces. <clears throat> the altar of Agni had 10,800 bricks. Guys, you can't make this stuff up. Every bit of this is verifiable. The altar of Agni had, was built of 10,800 bricks. This is in Hindu tradition. Hipparchus wrote that there were 1080 fixed stars. This is obviously a code for something else. 1080 fixed stars. In ancient Egyptian coffin text, spell 1080, we literally read, it is what came down from him onto the desert of sand. This is coffin text spell 1080. It's referring, this is a calendar coffin text. It is referring to the year 1080, when it came down from him onto the desert of sand. Remember, Abram, four-faced Brahma, went to Egypt to look for a city whose builder and maker was God. The Great Pyramids are also referenced in ancient Arabic traditions. They're called Aram of the Pillars. They weren't called pyramids. It's Iram of the Pillars. Iram was supposed to be the architect of these massive structures before the flood. This is the Arabic tradition. In the Arabic traditions, the Great Pyramids were built way before the flood. Here, here is a uh, What's his name? Muhammad Ibn Ab al Hokim, circa 855. This is this 12 centuries ago. Arabian author, 12 centuries ago, wrote the pyramids were antediluvian and they resisted the force of the great flood. There it is. This is an ancient Egyptian papyrus cited by Frederick Haberman. The God of the universe is the light above the firmament. And his symbols are upon the earth. Yeah, man. A lot of hermetic texts also say the same thing about uh, the ancients built symbols of God and they're still standing today. They're talking about the Great Pyramid. Yeah. And we've already seen this. Great Pyramid finished. We've seen that. Four-faced Brahmas move on. Agni built of 10,000 bricks. Ladder of set. Sorry, I'm sorry I'm repeating these. So, Eden. In Genesis, Eden was never lost. In Sumerian, it is Eden. Eden means walled enclosure. Eden was never lost. In ancient text, it's called Akuzan or Giza. The translation of Giza, G-I-Z-E-H, means border. Now, Akuzan built when Alpha Draconis, the serpent, was the pole star. All other stars rotating around this luminary symbolized by the serpent wrapped around the pole or the axis mundi, the world. This is, this is Eden right here, guys. Where's my, where we get to the bottom of this? Genesis message is of a world reset and rebirth cycle completed when the chief cornerstone descends upon the monument of man. I'm going to show you that. Here's the Great Pyramid, the Tree of Life, Axis Mundi, Pillar of Enoch, Monument of Man that will soon support the chief cornerstone. It does not have the cornerstone at the top. doesn't have it. Second Pyramid is the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. It is inferior. The Sphinx is the guardian cherub that covereth. It is a watcher. The Sphinx was the guardian of Eden that kept mankind from going back. What did the ancient Greeks say about the Sphinx? It was called the Riddler. 
the throttler, the Sphinx would kill you if you if you approached it because nobody could answer its riddle. And as soon as you were wrong in your answer, you died. This was this is the Sphinx. It kept people from from get, getting too close to Eden. This is Sumerian. In Innu is the sacred place built before the flood. This is in the Sumerian texts. This is what it's referring to. Giza, in the Sumerian text, inside Mount Sim Sumeru, is the, the Durga. The Durga is the king's chamber. It's right here. Durga, this just shows more, <coughs> excuse me, this is just more evidence that we live in a hollow field. Remember when I showed you examples that ancient Egyptian titles and names and the names of cities, if you reverse them, if you write them in reverse on paper, you get the names of Greek cities and Greek gods. Yeah, guys, it's, it's, it's crazy. Here's the same thing. Durga in Sumerian is the secret chamber where the tablets of destinies are held. That was here. The sarcophagus had the tablets of de destinies. They were programming templates. What is Durga in reverse in a holo field? It's a grid. This is a grid system showing a 138-year protocol. It's all in here. Tablets of destinies were located in the Durga. What were the tablets of destinies? The tablets of destinies were the past, present, and future, all recorded in stone. And whoever possessed the tablets of destinies was able to control the construct. In Innu is built by Enki, just as the Great Pyramid is built by Enoch. I'm not the one telling you the Great Pyramid of Enoch. The Egyptian cops are telling you that in the legend of Surid, when every single thing about Surid before the flood mirrors exactly what the book of Jasher says of Enoch before the flood. They are identical. And I've shown this in several presentations. Enki is the Sumerian Enoch. The secret chambers of Thoth, the plans with numbers of the Egyptian West Car Papyrus. That's what this is talking about. The West Car Papyrus is talking about this. These are the secret plans with numbers. I just showed you what those numbers are. They're the Phoenix phenomenon. Everything is self-referencing, guys. If you take, if you take a five-pointed star, do you know what this is made of? This is this is the Sumerian Dingir. It, it is literally translated as God. This is the, the Dingir symbol. To make a five-pointed star, you have to have 10 angles of 108 degrees. Therefore, this symbol is the, is the two-dimensional representation of the number 1080. I'm going to show you. And if you take that symbol, which is in two dimensions, and you render it into a three-dimensional form, five points turn into four, four points for a foundation, one at the apex. Three-dimensionally, the number 1080 becomes a pyramid. Can't make this stuff up. Yeah, guys, there's the chronal, chronal list of Stonehenge. That's a whole different study. But that's the Dengir again. Let's see, there's more examples. This is keystone geometry. I'm just going to educate you. This is not really relative here, but I'm going to educate you guys on this real quick. This is keystone geometry. This was published over 150 years ago. Keystone geometry is everywhere in Masonic arches, all kinds of all arch. That keystone is there for a purpose, and it's always at these dimensions right here if it's Masonic architecture, because key, the keystone geometry gives you the perfect pyramid, uh, geometrical pyramid. It's right here. It also embodies the number 36. But here it is right here. There's the pyramid. That's how you get the perfect pyramid in keystone geometry. This is at the top of all arches. All right. This chart here is important because it shows you. People think, well, we can't know anything about the Great Pyramid. We, how are you going to put all this information together? How is all this possible that Jason of Archaics was able to amass all this material? But well, let, me, let me show you this chart. This chart is very specific, guys. Look at all these events. Everything on this chart fit in an 817-year period. Look, 817-year period. 
all this chronological material that I've amassed from sources all over the world, all these calendars and date systems, timekeeping systems, all these actual historical events, all these things fit in 817 years. Why is it relevant to our study? Because this is 817 years before the Great Pyramid was even built. This is it. it. You have to understand things by context. If you don't yet know this history right here, if you don't know all this right here, then trying to research the Great Pyramid, you're walking into it blind. But by the time the Great Pyramid was built, civilization was already old. And that old civilization had been born out of a devastating reset. The Adam and Eve great pole shift reset that created a new heavens and a new earth. Year one of the pre-flood world, 3895 BC. I've got a whole video that just shows this history and explains every single year and how we got that date. Here it is, guys. The discovery of a controversial fossil backs up studies and theories that the Great Pyramids of Giza and the Mighty Sphinx were once submerged underwater. There it is, under sea. Now, I'm going to tell you now, that's really an oversimplification because in the 1740s through 60s, Frederick Norton Lewis found many fossils. After that, many authors in the 1800s all published their material saying that sea creatures and fossils were everywhere in the sand, seashells were everywhere in the Great Pyramid, and the Great Pyramid was buried up to a third of it in sand. So, yeah, the Sphinx, they had the, they, all they knew from the Sphinx in the ancient world was the top of its head. They didn't even know there was a huge statue down there for a while. All that was excavated and dug out. Now, this is why I have a problem with Robert Schock, Robert Bovell, Graham Hancock, and many others. I have a real problem because they have not assessed this data. They have, they have leapt on board with this BS narrative of Atlantis being 10,000 BC and totally ignoring all the historical evidence and the ancient historians that say 13th century BC. And they leap on board the Great Pyramid being 10,800 BC, which is so ludicrous, absolutely BS. The Great Pyramid is 2815 BC. It was underwater for 340 years, from 2239 B.C., the Great Flood of Noah, to 1899 B.C., when the entire North African plate, in an earthquake, basically experienced an upheaval, and it shoved the Mediterranean back as it elevated about 200 feet. So, this single event is what created the nine bows, which created the delta. The delta region is was created in this earthquake. It was created in minutes as the sea ran off and created all these rivulets from the Nile River. A clue is the fact that the Great Pyramid is 108 miles from the coast of the Mediterranean today. There's that number 108 again, and we're going to see it some more. But fossils have been found even inside the Great Pyramid, salt crustacean, all that inside the Great Pyramid. The, there was salt, there were, the, uh, the earliest excavators had to chisel all those tunnels free of salt. There was salt all in them. Here's the, uh, let's see, uh, here's, the, the ge here's the geometrical form of the word Arab and Sumer, which is, uh, the five-pointed star, here it is. I just, I've already showed you this to you. This is a, yeah, that's just how how a two-dimensional two-dimensional pentagram actually becomes a, a pyramid in three dimensions. All right, we've already been through that. So we get to the final file. We get to the final file. And this is, this is the one for which all this, hit that like button too. Don't be caught. Don't snipe. Don't snipe my channel. Don't get up in here sniping my channel, looking at my content, liking it, not and not hitting that like button. We'll be greedy. We're gonna get to the final file before this video gets too long. One final sound check. Make sure my stream yard's still working good. Get this real quick. Hmm. All right. I'm looking for, I don't know why I'm not seeing nobody verify if I got a uh, good audio or loud and clear. Thank you, Ellis. All right. <coughs> 
Guys, there are many other mysteries of the Great Pyramid. This video is an oversimplification of all the key points. You have to go to my Lost Secrets of Giza playlist to get to get the meat and potatoes. This was just to engender interest, and I only did this video because I had promised to my community that I was doing a video of this nature. So this is the video, but I need to wrap it up. So I need to get to the most important file right now before before we stop. Let me get to this file right now. Now that you just said I had that good audio. Okay, there's only there's only a dozen slides here, so you, you bear with me. And they're not in order, so we're just gonna go with it. All right. Using only the scientific measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie, we find so we find over and over, <clears throat> for those who have seen my pyramid charts, you know I have hundreds of them. I've only showed a few in this video. I have hundreds, and they show that the central axis of the Great Pyramid right here is the, is the face of the Great Step. It's, it is over and over and over in multiple different calendars. It focuses on our year of 1902, which was mentioned by Nostradamus. Now, Nostradamus also mentioned that many will die before the phoenix dies. He also, and, 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 and hey, remember guys, Nostradamus' quatrains focus on the month of May for the year 2040. Yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all very compelling, but I'm, I'm, I'm entertaining a tangent. So 1902 is right here, but the central axis of the entire pyramid and the central vertical axis to the subterranean, look at the bottom, that's the subterranean chamber way under the pyramid, but the central axis to that is 204. Look, 204 inches is the width of the king's chamber. 204 more inches is the width of, from the king's chamber to the great, the great step right here. 204 inches from the face of the great step, which is the central axis of the entire pyramid, to the central axis of the well pit is 204 inches. That's 204 years. That 204 years from 1902, 204 years, gives us 2106 AD, the year 6000 from the Adam and Eve reset. It's not. Remember, the Adam and Eve reset was 1,344 years of the Anunnaki chronology, which started in 5239 BC. This is just 6,000 years of our construct, not the one before. It ends in 2106 AD. What else ends in 2106 AD? Well, I'm going to show you. Remember, 204 is self-referencing. If the Great Pyramid is 51 degrees and it has four principal faces, once all its casing stones are, are intact, then that's 204. Again, it's referencing the year 204. I mean, 204 years. So let me show you that in a whole different species of analysis, we find right here that the Great Pyramid refers to 1902. Oh, there's the year 2070. I promised you guys a video on 2070. I haven't got that. But using the Mayan long count system in this analysis, we get to the year 1902. There, it's at the bottom. Right there. 1902 become, becomes the end of this analysis using the uh, Mayan long count. But 1902, is it's the focus of other videos. I'm not even worried about 1902. But I need you to see that multiple times in the Great Pyramid like this, here's a whole different way of looking at it. 1902 self-referencing going in two different directions. It's a palindrome starting in, 30, in 1135 BC right here, the axis conjunct in the middle. You can go down the measurement all the way to the bottom, at the bottom down here, and it ends in 1902 AD, which is 5796 uh, uh, Annus Mundi right here. Or you can go the other direction and go toward outside the pyramid. Then when you get to the entrance of the pyramid, go vertically down eight, 1,828 pyramid inches all the way down to the equal, equal horizontal depth that you started the measurement way over here with 1902. It ends in 1902 as well, right there at the vertical distance. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of those, but they're not really important. I just need, need to show you that... This, uh, um, where's it? Let's see, I'm going to, I'm looking for, 
that's another reference to 1902. I'm not interested in that. I'm trying to find something else. 5796. This is this is just more different ways of finding the same thing. Self-referencing, 5796 is 1902. You guys already know about 1902. I have to tell you about that. So look at this. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 19 through 20 is right here. <clears throat> it specifically says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border, which is Giza, thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Now, this is the altar of Adam. This is the pillar of Enoch. That is be, this is the altar of agony, the fire altar. That is what is being described here. But many people over a hundred years ago were, were playing with Hebrew gematria, and they made a discovery. They made the discovery that that Bible verse in Hebrew equals the geometrical value of 5,448. And I'm telling you, and so it's, it's been published in many books before I was even born, that the vertical height of the Great Pyramid, right here, here's the Great Pyramid. There's the height of the Great Pyramid. The vertical height of the Great Pyramid right there is 5,448 inches without the cornerstone. The cornerstone is not added. The flat platform on the top of the pyramid is 5,448 pyramid inches high. Identifying this Bible verse. This Bible verse is gematrically identifying the Great Pyramid as the altar of the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Guys, in the book of Revelation, what do we have? We have the two witnesses and the two witnesses, and we have what? 144,000 prophets, saints in the last days. What is the Great Pyramid covered up, Covered with 144,000 white stones. What does the book of Revelation say? To he who overcometh, I will give you a white stone and a new name. The book of Revelation is, is literally outlining that the apocalypse is about identifying those who are going to be a part of the monument of man and exit the construct, and those who are going to stay here to enjoy another Genesis, Adam and Eve, Edenic type reset and go through this whole construct all over again. It is programming. This is a huge oversimplification to a tremendous amount of data. Like I said, this video is an overview. But look at this. The cornerstone. This cornerstone, if the cornerstone was intact, it would be 3,666 inches high, which is 5,814 inches, if the cornerstone was intact, but it's not. So we have a reference in the book of Enoch that Enoch wrote 366 books. I find that very intriguing. Book Here it is. Enoch wrote 366 books. Yeah, what are we looking at here? What is the Great Pyramid? What are all these 203 levels of blocks containing all these bricks? Is this a book? And if it is a book, it's the book of what? The great A book is only a container of knowledge. If the pyramid was a book and every soul was a stone of man, and the chief cornerstone was going to descend in the 6,000th year, which is 2106 AD. What book is it? It's the book of what? So, not only is the 366 inches up here a reference to the 366 books of Enoch, but even the 204, remember the Great Pyramid is 204 levels. So, we know from Second Esdras, written in Greek, we know from the, apocalypse, the apocryphal book of Esdras that Ezra wrote 204 books. This is what it says in the Apocrypha. This text was removed from the Old Testament canon. It's in the Apocrypha. Ezra wrote 204 books. Here it is. Concerning judgment and resurrection. The Great Pyramid is the library. 
It's 204 books being the courses of masonry completed when the chief cornerstone descends upon a pillar of righteous humanity. Let's take this a little further. There are 203 levels in the Great Pyramid. We've already seen multiple times in my videos and published books, you have seen the foundation of the Great Pyramid also represents the year 1902. 1902 AD begins the Giza course countdown. 1902 AD begins the last days. 1902 is 138 years before 2040, which is 204 times 10. But there's only 203 levels here. 203 levels of blocks from 1902 gives us the year, here it is, 5999 Annis Mundi. There's one year missing. The 204th level is missing. Remember, 51 degree angles, four 51 degree angles is 204. The, the pyramid is unfinished. The descent of the chief cornerstone is necessary to finish the, the monument of man. The, 200 and, the, 204th, the 204th would turn 5999 to 6,000, just like that. It would be the year 2106. Here it is, 51 degrees, 204. Here it is again, 204 levels is 5,814 inches or 484 and a half feet high is what, what, what the Great Pyramid would be. Now, the passage axis conjunct right here, 820 AD. Why is 820 AD so important? Because 820 AD is when mankind first learned about all this. The ascendant passage, the grand gallery, the queen's chamber, the king's chamber, the antechamber, 820 AD is when the is when the caliph of Baghdad, uh, uh, Al-Mamon and his men tunneled into the Great Pyramid and made this epic discovery that the Great Pyramid in Egypt was different than every other pyramid in the world. It is the first year humans after the flood learned this information. Using 820 AD as a reference point, we get the year 6000 Annus Mundi or 2106 AD right here. Pyramid is re self-referencing. It's all here. And there's other, there's, other way, there's other ways to look at this. Uh, believe me, I've got hundreds of great pyramid charts. These are only a few in this video. But here is, here is the full chronology right here, guys. I've got this. I've got this chart on my podium. This is the full chronology from 5239 BC, the very beginning of the Anunnaki nurse system, all the way to to uh, 2106 AD, the return of the chief cornerstone. This is the 7,344 years of this entire period. Why is that number important? From the beginning of Anunnaki reckoning to the the return of the chief cornerstone, sealing the book of life. Remember, book of the Re book of Revelation is very clear. To once the book of life is shut by by the by the by the return of the chief cornerstone, the monument of man is done. It has been surfaced when 144,000 white stones, casing stones, that's the last 144,000 uh, elect to die during the during the tribulation period. Once all that's done, the world is still going to be teeming with people. But they're about to go through some terrible shit. But not the people who have awakened. The people who have become a part of the monument of man. The people who are going to make their exodus. How do we know it's an exodus? It's very clear. The number is 7,344. It is divided by three is 2448. What was 2448? All my Archaic Arch veterans know this. 2448 Annus Mundi was 1447 BC. It is the Exodus. It is when it is when good people leave a bad world. That's what the story is about. 1447 BC was the Exodus event. 2440. I'm going to tell you now. Everything is self-referencing from 1902. 203 levels of blocks to the final year, 5,999, which is 2105 AD. 
the chief cornerstone makes the 204th block. 204 years from 1902 is the end. The book of life is shut for this entire simulacrum construct run. All these people living life is shut. How do we know? Because 204 years is 2448 months. It's self-referencing. 2448 is the number for Exodus. Over and over, I've showed this number many times in my research. It always concerns the removal of a people out of a situation. Every time. For those who don't know, I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of charts. You need to click onto my link, my link index. I have a link index on my website and a bunch of my videos. Now, for those of you who think I'm crazy, I'm going to show you a scientific measurement that verifies. I just told you the whole length of the of the of the of the entire chronological simulacrum is 7344 years. And I showed you that 204 years from 1902, the beginning of the last days, the last Phoenix, the last Phoenix year till till 2106, the return of the chief cornerstone to finish the monument of man is 204 years, which is 2448 months. I'm now going to show you that the Great Pyramid Apothem scientific measurement for the sloping angle at 51 degrees from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid at 51 degrees, the sloping angle is 612 feet. 612 feet, guys. Now, I'm going to show you what 612 feet is. Six hundred and twelve feet is precisely seven thousand three hundred and forty four inches. Remember, in the eighteen hundreds, the books in the eighteen hundreds say that the Great Pyramid speaks in inches. Can't make this stuff up, guys. Here's my here's an, here's here's an illustration I did right here. Look at this. Look look to the far right. Exterior sloping. Distance of Great Pyramid, 7,344 pyramid inches, confirms the monument's interior 7,344-year timeline right here. Here it is, guys. The exterior sloping distance of 7,344 inches confirms the interior pyramid timeline that I have shown. It's all here. It's absolutely amazing. Everything is self-referencing. This is the final chart of the entire presentation. This too shows, this right here shows also uh, 7,344 years of history. 7,344 years of the timeline verified in over 100 archaics and video presentations and published books. Here is the timeline. <laughs> archaics begins in 5239 BC because that's the oldest, most ancient calendar, which is based off 600 year units called the Anuna. I have, I have whole videos about the Anuna nerve system. Here it is, guys. The, the middle of this calendar, you can't make this stuff up. The middle of this calendar is the year 1561. The center year in 7,344 years is 3,672 years before 1567 BC and 3,672 years after. Why is this important? Because it shows that our holography is a palindrome. The dead center of this entire calendar of 7,344 years is the Battle of Megiddo, the most one of the most ancient famous battles in the ancient world. It is the Battle of Armageddon back then. What happens in 2106? Uh, A.D., in the year 6,000 Annus Mundi, when the chief cornerstone descend, what does he come? He comes for the Battle of Armageddon. This is in the book of Revelation. Can't make this stuff up, guys. This presentation is over. I showed all my slides. It is an oversimplification for a much more broader, a much more comprehensive topic that's literally taking me about 40 hours in videos to produce. I can't do it all in one video. But this was it. This was this was my presentation for this. I hope you I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, it's it's longer than I, it's typically longer than the, the type of videos I normally do. But everything is self-referencing. I tell you guys over and over: if something is true, it can be seen from multiple different mathematical vantage points. You cannot 
You cannot stress enough the importance of using the scientific measurements because it is the scientific measurements that just produced all this material for you. The scientific establishment sent an intellectual giant to go measure the pyramid to the thousandth of an inch, Sir Flinders Petrie, and he did so. And then they used his research to completely undermine and ridicule everybody from the 1800s who had a suspicion that the Great Pyramid was preserving the future in stone. Their intuition as spiritual beings had them researching, had them looking, had them doing all these things, but they lacked the component of knowing about the Phoenix phenomenon. Understanding the Phoenix phenomenon and having a background in chronology and studying so many different timekeeping systems is the only way any of this information could have been decoded. But anybody could have done it, but, but it required decades of meticulous chronological research in order to see the value of the scientific measurements. I'm hungry, guys. I'm real hungry. And that's cause for me to go ahead and hit this outro. I love you guys. You got your presentation, I promised. But uh, I'm gonna hit this, I'm gonna hit this mega outro now. I got some new things tucked into my outro.